In a timeless realm, where echoes of ancient civilizations linger among sacred stones, stands Delphi, the enigmatic birthplace of wisdom and knowledge. In this hallowed space, where the heavens and earth meet, oracles speak truths that reach beyond human comprehension, weaving the mysteries of existence into the lives of those who come seeking guidance. Within this sanctuary of Apollo, divine guardian of reason, gather the chosen few to unravel the riddles of life and death. Among them shines Pythagoras, a figure whose brilliant intellect and passionate spirit push him past the boundaries of his era. Regarded as both sage and mystic, Pythagoras pursues truths not only in numbers and proportions, but ventures deep into the soul's depths, searching for harmony between cosmos and self. This book is more than a record of his teachings. It is an exploration through the layers of reality, a descent into the depths of ancient wisdom. As we peel back the secrets of Delphi, we witness the cosmic interplay of destiny and free will, of shadow and light. Each page invites us deeper into mysteries that have captivated philosophers, theologians, and seekers of truth across millennia. Here, Pythagoras' teachings come alive, like a sacred chant resonating within. With open minds and receptive hearts, we are invited to uncover truths hidden within the words of a master and the visions of an oracle. This journey offers not only a glimpse into the mysteries of Delphi, but a confrontation with our own existential questions, challenging the limits of time and space in search of our humanity's essence. Welcome to the Mysteries of Delphi Pythagoras, a journey that transcends the past and extends into infinity. Pythagoras, the Mysteries of Delphi, yes. know thyself and you will know the universe and the gods. Inscription from the Temple of Delphi. Dream, vision, and ecstasy are the three doors to the beyond, where the science of the soul and the art of divination reside. Evolution is the law of life. Number is the law of the universe. Unity is the law of God. Greece in the 6th century. The soul of Orpheus had crossed like a divine meteor under the stormy sky of emerging Greece. Gone, darkness once again enveloped it after a series of revolutions. The tyrants of Thrace burned his books, overthrew his temples, exiled his disciples. The Greek kings and many cities, more jealous of their unbridled license than of the justice that flows from pure doctrines, imitated him. They sought to erase his memories, to destroy his last remnants, so much so that a few centuries after his death, part of Greece doubted his existence. In vain, the initiated kept his tradition for over a thousand years. In vain, Pythagoras and Plato spoke of him as a divine man. The sophists and rhetoricians saw in him nothing but a legend about the origin of music. Even today, sages still resolutely deny the existence of Orpheus, relying primarily on the fact that Homer and Hesiod never spoke his name. But the silence of these poets can be explained by the prohibition imposed by local governments. The disciples of Orpheus spared no opportunity to submit all disputes between the different states of Greece to the arbitration of the Council of Amphictyons. This annoyed both demagogues and tyrants. Homer, who probably received his initiation from ancient Tyre and whose mythology is the poetic translation of the theology of Sanconiathon, could very well have been unaware of the Dory of Orpheus, whose tradition was all the more secretive because it was persecuted. As for Diodorus, Born near Parnassus, he must have known his name and doctrine through the sanctuary of Delphi, but his initiators imposed silence on him, and rightly so. However, Orpheus lived in his work, lived in his disciples, and in those who denied him. Where is this work? Where should we seek this living soul? Will it be in the military and fierce oligarchy of Sparta, where science is despised, ignorance erected as a system, and brutality required as a complement to valour? Will it be in those relentless wars of Messenia, where the Spartans pursued a neighbouring people to extermination, and those Romans of Greece presided over the Tarpeian rock and the bloody laurels of the capital, plunging into an abyss Aristomenes, defender of his homeland? Will it be in the turbulent democracy of Athens, always ready to drift towards tyranny? Will it be in the Praetorian guard of Pisistratus, or in the dagger of Harmodius and Aristogiton, hidden beneath a myrtle branch? Will it be in the many cities of Hellas, Great Greece and Asia Minor, where Athens and Sparta offer two opposing types? Could it be that all these democracies and tyrannies, envious, jealous and always ready to fight among themselves, are not the soul of Greece? No. The soul of Greece is not there. It is in its temples, in its mysteries and in its initiates. It is in the sanctuary of Jupiter at Olympia, of Juno at Argos, of Demeter at Eleusis. 
It reigns over Athens with Minerva and radiates at Delphi with Apollo, who dominates and penetrates all temples with his light. It is the center of Hellenic life, the brain and heart of Greece. There go the poets to learn who translate for the multitude the great sublime truths into living images, the sages who propagate them through subtle dialectic. The spirit of Orpheus circulates wherever immortal Greece beats. We find it in the struggles of poetry and in gymnastics, in the games of Delphi and at Olympia, happy institutions that envisioned the master's events to connect and spread the twelve Greek tribes. We touch it in the court of the Amphictyons, in this assembly of great initiates, the supreme and arbitral court that convened at Delphi, great power of justice and concord, in which only Greece found its unity in times of heroism and selflessness. The oath of the associated peoples gives an idea of the grandeur and social strength of this institution. We swear never to overthrow the Amphictyonic cities, never to divert the resources necessary for their needs, whether in times of peace or war. If any power dares to threaten them, we will march against it and destroy its cities. If the impious steal the offerings from the temple of Apollo, we swear to employ our feet, our arms, our voices, all our strength against them and their accomplices. However, this Greece of Orpheus, which had for intellect a pure doctrine preserved in the temples, for soul a plastic religion, and for body a high tribunal of justice centralized in Delphi, was beginning to decline. Already in the seventh century, the orders of Delphi were no longer respected, and the sacred territories were being violated. This was because the race of great inspired individuals had vanished. The intellectual and moral level of the temples had declined. The priests were selling themselves to political powers, and even the mysteries began to corrupt. The overall aspect of Greece had changed. The majestic priesthood and agricultural life were replaced by simple tyranny or anarchic democracy. The temples were already powerless to prevent the threatening dissolution. There was a need for new help. A popularization of the esoteric doctrines had become necessary for the thought of Orpheus to live and flourish in all its splendor. The science of the temples needed to pass to the lay orders. It thus slipped under various disguises into the corporation of civil legislators, in the schools of poets, and under the porticos of philosophers. The latter felt in their teachings the same necessity that Orpheus had recognized for religion, that of two doctrines, one public, the other secret which exposed the same truth in different measures and forms appropriate to the development of their thoughts. This evolution gave Greece its three great centuries of artistic creation and cultural and intellectual splendor. It allowed Orphic thought, which is both the primary impulse and the ideal synthesis of Greece, to concentrate all its light and irradiate it over the whole world before its political edifice, undermined by internal dissensions, collapsed under the blows of Macedonia, and sank entirely under the iron hand of Rome. The evolution we have spoken of had many craftsmen. It brought forth physicists, such as legislators like Solon, poets like Pindar, and heroes like Epaminondas. But it had a recognized leader, a first-rate initiate, a sovereign, creative, and organizing intelligence. Pythagoras is the master of lay Greece, just as Orpheus is of priestly Greece. He translated and continued the religious thought of his predecessor and applied it to new times. But his translation is a creation because he coordinates the orgic inspirations into a complete system. He provides scientific proof of his teaching and moral proof in his educational institution in the Pythagorean order that survives him. Although Pythagoras appears in the full light of history, he is an almost legendary figure. The main reason for this lies in the fierce persecution he suffered in Sicily, which cost the lives of many Pythagoreans. Some perished crushed under the debris of their burned school, while others died of hunger in a temple. The memory and doctrine of the master were perpetuated only by the survivors who managed to flee to Greece. Plato, through great effort and at great cost, obtained a manuscript from the master through Archytas, who, moreover, never wrote down his doctrine other than through secret signs and in symbolic form. His true action, like that of all reformers, was carried out through oral teaching but the essence of the system remains in the golden verses of Isis, in the commentary of Heracles, in the fragments of Philolaus and Archytas, as well as in Plato's Timaeus, which contains Pythagorean cosmogony. The writers of antiquity, finally, are filled with the philosopher of Croton. They are not lacking in anecdotes that depict his wisdom, beauty, and wonderful power over men. 
The Neoplatonists of Alexandria, the Gnostics, and even the early fathers of the Church cite him as an authority, valuable testimonies in which the powerful wave of enthusiasm that Pythagoras's great personality communicated to Greece still resonates and whose last ripples are felt eight centuries after his death. Viewed as a whole, opened with the keys of esotericism, his doctrine presents a magnificent whole, an isolated synthesis whose parts are linked by a fundamental conception. In it, we find a reasoned reproduction of the esoteric doctrine of India and Egypt, to which he gave Hellenic clarity and simplicity, uniting with it a more vigorous feeling, a clearer idea of human freedom. At the same time, and in various parts of the globe, great reformers were popularizing similar doctrines. Lao Tse emerged from the esotericism of China. The last Buddha, Sakyamuni, preached on the banks of the Ganges. In Italy, the Etruscan priest sent an initiate to Rome equipped with civil books. King Numa attempted to restrain the threatening ambition of the Roman Senate through wise institutions. It is not by pure coincidence that these reformers appear at the same time in such diverse peoples. Their different missions contribute to a common objective. They prove that at certain times, a single spiritual current mysteriously traverses all of humanity. Whence does it come, from that divine world beyond our sight, but whose geniuses and prophets are sent as witnesses. Uh, Pythagoras traveled the ancient world before preaching in Greece. He saw Africa and Asia, Memphis and Babylon. His politics and initiation, his stormy life resemble a boat launched into a storm, sails unfurled, pursuing its goal without deviating from its path, an image of calm and strength amid the unleashed elements. His doctrine is that of a cool night following the sharp fires of a bloody day. It evokes the beauty of the firmament, which gradually unfolds its sparkling archipelagos and ethereal harmonies above the head of the seer. Let us try to bring out both the obscurities of the legend and the prejudices of his school. The Years of Travel Samos, at the beginning of the 6th century before our era, was one of the most flourishing islands of Ionia. The rarity of its port opened in front of the violet mountains of Asia Minor, from where all luxuries and seductions came. In a wide bay lay the city on the green shore, and the amphitheatre presented itself on the mountain at the foot of a promontory, crowned by the Temple of Neptune. The colonnades of a magnificent temple dominated it. There reigned the tyrant Polycrates. After depriving Samos of its freedoms, he had given lustre to the arts and an Asian splendour. The Heterai of Lesbos, called by him, had settled in a nearby palace and invited young men to parties where they taught them the most refined pleasures, seasoned with music, dances, and feasts. Anacreon, called to Samos by Polycrates, was brought on a tream with purple sails, golden masts, and the poet, a silver cup engraved in hand, made his scented sodas flow before this court of pleasure like a rain of roses. Polycrates' fortune was known throughout Greece. He had as a friend the pharaoh Amosis, who warned him several times to beware of such continuous luck and especially not to make it the foundation. Polycrates responded to the Egyptian monarch's advice by throwing his ring into the sea. I make this sacrifice to the gods, he said. The next day, a fisherman brought the tyrant the precious ring he had found in the belly of his fish. When the pharaoh learned this, he declared that he was breaking his friendship with Polycrates, for such insolent fortune attracted the vengeance of the gods. Be that as it may, the end of Polycrates was tragic. One of his satraps sent him to a neighboring province, had him expire in agony, and ordered that his body be attached to a cross on Mount Mycale. In this way, the inhabitants of Samos could see, during a bloody sunset, the corpse of their tyrant crucified on a promontory, facing the island where he had reigned in glory and pleasure. Let's return to the beginning of the reign. On a clear night, a young man was sitting in a forest of Agnus Cactus with shiny leaves, not far from the temple of Juno. The full moon bathed the Doric façade, highlighting its mystical majesty. Long ago, a scroll of papyrus containing a hymn of Homer had fallen at his feet. His meditation, begun at dusk, still lingered and stretched into the silence of the night. The sun had long set, but its blazing disk still floated before the eyes of the young dreamer in an unreal presence, for his thoughts wandered far from the visible world. Pythagoras was the son of a wealthy ring merchant from Samos and a woman named Parthenis. 
The Pythia of Delphi, consulted during a trip by the young couple, had promised them a son who would be useful to all men in all times. The oracle had sent the couple to Sidon in Phoenicia, so that the destined son would be conceived, shaped, and born far from the disturbances and influences of his homeland. Before the birth of the wonderful child, his parents fervently dedicated him to the light of Apollo and to the moon of love. The child was born, and when he turned one, his mother, following a prior counsel from the priests of Delphi, took him to the temple of Adonai in a valley of Lebanon. There, the high priest blessed him. Then his family brought him back to Samos. The son of Parthenus was very beautiful, gentle, moderate, filled with justice. Only the intellectual passion shone in his eyes, giving them and his actions a secret energy. Far from hindering him, his parents encouraged his precocity in the study of wisdom. He had conferred with the priests of Samos and with the sages who were beginning to form schools in Ionia, where they taught the principles of physics. At eighteen, he had followed the lessons of Hemodamus of Samos, and at twenty, those of Pherezide in Tyre. He had also conferred with Thales and Anaximander of Miletus. These masters opened new horizons for him, but none satisfied him. Among their contradictory teachings he sought internally the link, the synthesis, the unity of the great whole. Now the son of Parthenus had reached one of those crises where the spirit, agitated by the contradictions of things, concentrates in a supreme effort all its faculties to glimpse the end, to find the path that leads to the Son of Truth, to the center of life. On that warm and splendid night, the Son of Parthenus alternately gazed at the earth, the temple, and the starry sky. Demeter, the earth mother, the nature he wished to penetrate was there beneath him. He breathed in her powerful emanations, felt the irresistible attraction that chained him to her, a heavy atom as an inseparable part of himself. Those he had consulted had told him that everything comes from nature, nothing comes from nothing. The soul comes from water or fire, or both, a subtle emanation of the elements. It escapes from them only to penetrate them again. Eternal nature is blind and inflexible. Resign yourself to her fatal law. Your only merit will be to know her and submit to her. Then he looked at the firmament and the letters of fire that formed the constellations in the unfathomable depth of space, these letters must have meaning, for if the infinitely small of atoms has its reason for being, as the infinitely large, the dispersion of the stars, whose aggregation represents the body of the universe, would it not? Thus each of these worlds has its own law, and all together move according to a number and in supreme harmony. But who will ever decipher the alphabet of the stars? The priests of Juno had told him, It is the heaven of the gods that was before the earth. Your soul comes from there. Now, before them, they must rise again. This meditation was interrupted by voluptuous songs emanating from a garden on the banks of the Yan. The lascivious voices of the lesbians harmonized languorously with the sounds of the lyre. The young girls responded with simple tunes. These voices suddenly mingled with other sharp and mournful cries from the port. These were rebels that Polycrates had loaded onto a boat to sell them as slaves in Asia. They were struck with belts armed with nails to be crammed under the rowers' benches. Their howls and blasphemies faded into the night. Then everything fell into silence. The young man felt a painful shiver, but he suppressed it to gather himself inwardly. The problem presented itself to him, more piercing, more acute. The earth spoke of fatality. The sky spoke of providence and humanity, which floats between the two, responded with folly, pain, and slavery. But deep within himself, the future adept heard an invincible voice that responded to the chains of the earth and the bursts of the sky with this cry, freedom. Who was right then? The wise, the priest, the madman, the unfortunate, or himself? To all these voices he said truth. Each triumphed in its sphere, but none revealed to him its reason for being. The three worlds existed immutable like the breast of Demeter, like the light of the stars, and like the human heart. But only he who could find their agreement and the law of their balance would be a true sage. Only he who possessed divine science and could help men in the synthesis of the three worlds held the secret of the cosmos. By pronouncing this word he had just discovered, Pythagoras stood up, his fascinated gaze fixed on the Doric façade of the temple. The imposing edifice seemed transfigured under the chaste rays of Diana. 
In it, he believed he saw the ideal image of the world and the solution to the problem he sought, for the base, the columns, the architrave, and the triangular pediment suddenly represented to him the triple nature of man and the universe, of the microcosm and the macrocosm, crowned by the divine unity that in itself is a trinity. The cosmos, dominated and penetrated by God, formed the sacred tetrad, an immense and pure symbol, source of natura, model of the gods. The golden verses of Pythagoras translate pleas by Oliver. Yes, it was there, hidden in those geometric lines, the key to the universe, the science of numbers, the ternary law that governs the constitution of beings, that of the sevenfold that presides over its evolution. And in a grand vision, Pythagoras saw the worlds move to the rhythm and harmony of the sacred numbers, saw the balance of the earth and the sky, whose faithful scale represents the three worlds, natural, human and divine, supporting each other, determining each other, and playing the universal drama through a dual descending and ascending movement. He sensed the spheres of the invisible world, enveloping the visible and animating it ceaselessly. He conceived the purification and liberation of man from this earth through the triple initiation. He saw all this, his life and his work, in an instant and clear illumination, with the irrefutable certainty of the spirit standing before the truth. It was a flash. Now it was a matter of proving by reason what his pure intelligence had penetrated in the Absolute. For that he needed a human life, a Herculean labor, but where to find the necessary knowledge to accomplish such a task? Neither the hymns of Homer, nor the sages of Ionia, nor the temples of Greece could suffice. The spirit of Pythagoras, which had suddenly found wings, plunged into his past, into his birth surrounded by veils, and into the mysterious love of his mother. A childhood memory struck him with incisive precision. He recalled that his mother had taken him, at the age of one, to a valley in Lebanon, to the temple of Adonai, he saw himself as a child, clinging to the neck of Parthenis, amidst the colossal mountains of enormous forests where a river cascaded. She stood on a terrace, shaded by large cedars. Before her, a majestic priest with a white beard smiled at the mother and child, uttering grave words that he did not understand. His mother had often reminded him of the strange words of the Hierophant of Adonai, O woman of Ionia. Your son will be great in wisdom, but remember that if the Greeks still possess the science of the gods, the science of God can only be found in Egypt. These words returned to him with his mother's smile, with the beautiful face of the old man, and the distant roar of the waterfall, dominated by the voice of the priest in a grandiose landscape, like a dream of another life. For the first time he guessed the meaning of the oracle. He had heard of the prodigious knowledge of the Egyptian priests and their formidable mysteries, but he believed he could ignore them. Now he understood that he needed this science of God to penetrate the depths of nature, and that he would find it only in the temples of Egypt. It was the gentle Parthenis who, with her maternal instinct, had prepared him for this work, leading him like a living offering to the sovereign God. From then on, he resolved to go to Egypt to be initiated. Polycrates boasted of protecting philosophers just as he did poets, he hastened to give Pythagoras a letter of recommendation for Pharaoh Amasis, who presented him to the priests of Memphis. They barely welcomed him, and after many difficulties, the Egyptian sages, who regarded the Greeks as frivolous and fickle, did everything they could to discourage the young man. But the novice submitted to unshakable patience and courage in the face of the slowness and trials imposed upon him. He knew in advance that only knowledge would come from the complete control of the will over his entire being. His initiation lasted twenty-two years under the pontificate of the great priest Sonkis. We have recounted in the Book of Hermes the trials, temptations, terrors, and ecstasies of the initiate of Isis up to the apparent and cataleptic death of the adept and his resurrection in the temple of Osiris. Pythagoras went through all these phases that allowed him to realize, not as a vain theory but as a living thing, the doctrine of the word light or of the universal word and that of human evolution through seven planetary cycles. At each step of this dizzying ascent, the trials renewed themselves, becoming increasingly formidable. A hundred times he risked his life, especially if he wanted to master the occult forces, the dangerous practice of magic and theurgy. Like all great men, Pythagoras had faith in his star. Nothing that could lead to science was an obstacle for him, and the fear of death did not stop him, for he saw life in an afterlife. 
when the priest recognized in him an extraordinary strength of soul and that impersonal passion for wisdom which is the rarest thing in the world, they opened the treasures of their experience. Among them, he formed and trembled. There he could deepen the sacred mathematics, the science of numbers or universal principles, which became the center of his system and which he formulated in a new way. The rigor of Egyptian discipline in the temples also made him aware of the prodigious power of the human will, wisely exercised and strengthened, and its infinite applications to both body and soul. The science of numbers and the art of will are the two keys to magic, said the priests of Memphis. They open all the doors of the universe. It was therefore in Egypt that Pythagoras acquired this view from the heights that allows one to see the spheres of life and sciences in a concentric order, to understand the involution of the spirit into matter through universal creation and its evolution or flight toward unity through this individual creation that is called the development of consciousness. Pythagoras had reached the summit of the Egyptian priesthood and perhaps thought of returning to Greece when war broke out in the Nile Basin. With all its errors, it dragged the initiate of Osiris into a new whirlwind. For a long time, the despots of Asia had meditated on the loss of Egypt. Their repeated assaults over centuries had failed before the wisdom of Egyptian institutions, before the strength of the priesthood and the energy of the pharaohs. But the ancient kingdom, that of the science of Hermes, could not last forever. The son of the conqueror of Babylon also launched himself against Egypt with his countless armies, hungry like swarms of locusts. He put an end to the institution of the pharaoh, whose origin was lost in the mists of time. In the eyes of the wise, it was a catastrophe for the entire world. Until then, Egypt had covered Europe with Asia. Its protective influence still extended over the entire Mediterranean basin through the temples of Phoenicia, Greece and Etruria, with which the high Egyptian priesthood maintained constant relations. Once this wall was breached, the bull would charge headlong onto the banks of the Elenia. Pythagoras thus witnessed Cambyses invade Egypt. He could see the Persian despot, a worthy heir of the malevolent kings of Nineveh and Babylon, plundering the temples of Memphis and Thebes and destroying that of Ammon. He could see the Semitic pharaoh brought before Cambyses, shackled, placed on a mound surrounded by the priests, the leading families, and the court of the king. He saw the pharaoh's daughter dressed in rags, and followed by all her ladies-in-waiting, also disguised, with the royal prince and two thousand youths, gagged and led by a halter around their necks, before being decapitated. To the Semitic pharaoh, holding back his disgust at this horrific scene, and to the infamous Cambyses sitting on his throne, rejoicing in the pain of his defeated adversary. A cruel but instructive lesson from history. After the lessons of science, what an image of unleashed animal nature in man, producing such a monster of despotism that tramples everything and imposes upon humanity the kingdom of the most relentless fate. By his appalling apotheosis, Cambyses had Pythagoras transported to Babylon along with part of the Egyptian priesthood, and he interned him in that country, as Yamlico reports in his Life of Pythagoras. This colossal city, which Plato compares to a country surrounded by walls, then offered a vast field of observation. Ancient Babel, the great whore of the Hebrew prophets, was more than ever after the Persian conquest a pandemonium of peoples, languages, cults and religions, amidst which Asian despotism raised its dizzying tower. According to Persian traditions, its foundation dated back to the legendary Semiramis. It was said that she built her monstrous perimeter of 85 kilometers of walls, where two chariots could run side by side with its stacked terraces, massive palaces adorned with polychrome reliefs, its temples supported by stone elephants and topped with multicolored dragons. There succeeded a series of despots who had tyrannized Chaldea, Syria, Persia, part of Tartary, Judea, Syria, and Asia Minor. It was there that Nebuchadnezzar, the assassin of the magicians, had taken the Jewish people captive, who continued to practice their worship in a corner of the vast city, where London could have fallen four times. The Jews had given the great king a powerful minister in the person of the prophet Daniel during the reign of Belshazzar, son of Nebuchadnezzar, the walls of ancient Babylon had finally collapsed under the vengeful blows of Cyrus, and Babylon passed under Persian domination for several centuries. At that time, before the moment when Pythagoras arrived, three different religions hated each other within the high priesthood of Babylon, 
the ancient Chaldean priests, the survivors of Persian magic, and the elite of the Jewish captivity. What proves that these various priesthoods agreed on the esoteric level is precisely the role of Daniel, who, by continuing to affirm the God of Moses, was prime minister under Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, and Cyrus. Pythagoras was to broaden his already vast horizon by studying these doctrines, these religions, and these cults, the synthesis of which was still preserved by certain initiates. In Babylon, he was able to deepen his knowledge of the magicians who were the heirs of Zoroaster. If the Egyptian priests only possessed the universal keys to the sacred sciences, the Persian magicians were reputed to have gone further in the practice of certain arts. They claimed to master the hidden powers of nature, known as pantomorphic fire and astral light. It was said that in their temples, darkness was born in full light, that the lamps ignited themselves, that the gods were seen radiating, and that thunder could be heard rumbling. The magicians called this incorporeal fire the heavenly Leon, a generating agent of electricity, which they knew how to condense or dissipate at will, directing atmospheric electrical currents and terrestrial magnetic ones like arrows upon men. They had also studied the suggestive, attractive and creative power of human speech, employing graded formulas drawn from the oldest languages on earth for evoking spirits. Here is the physical reason they gave. Change nothing about the barbarous names of the evocation, for they are the pantheistic names of God. They emanate from the worship of a multitude, and their power is ineffable. This referred to the oracles of Zoroaster, collected in the Theurgy of Proclus. These evocations, practiced amidst purifications and prayers, were what later came to be called white magic. Thus Pythagoras penetrated in Babylon into the arcana of ancient magic, at the same time as into this lair of despotism, and he observed another spectacle over the ruins of the destructive religions of the East. Above this degenerate and poor priesthood, a group of intrepid initiates, united, defended their science, their faith, and as much justice as possible, standing before the despots like Daniel in the lion's den, always in danger of being devoured. They fascinated and tamed the fierce beast of absolute power with their intellectual prowess, contesting ground inch by inch. After his Egyptian and Chaldean initiation, the son of Samos knew much more than his physics masters and any other Greek of his time, whether priest or layman. They knew the eternal principles of the universe and their applications. Nature had opened its abysses to him. The coarse veils of matter had torn before his eyes to show him the wondrous spheres of nature and of spiritual humanity. In the Temple of Night, Isis at Memphis, he had learned many secrets about the past of religions, about the history of continents and races. He had been able to compare the advantages and disadvantages of Jewish monotheism with Greek polytheism, Indian Trinitarianism, and Persian dualism. He knew that all these religions were rays of the same truth, filtered through various degrees of intelligence and for different social states. He had the key, that is, the synthesis of all these doctrines within esoteric sciences. His gaze encompassed the past, and immersing himself in the future, he was to judge the present with a singular lucidity. His experience showed him humanity threatened by the greatest plagues, the ignorance of the priests, the materialism of the sages, and the indiscipline of democracies. Amidst universal laxity, he saw Asian despotism grow, and from this black cloud, a formidable cyclone was about to unleash upon unfortunate Europe. It was therefore time to return to Greece to fulfill his mission to begin his work. Pythagoras had been interned in Babylon for twelve years. To get out, an order from the king of the Persians was required. A compatriot, Democedes, the physician, interceded on his behalf and obtained the philosopher's freedom. Pythagoras thus returned to Samos after thirty-four years of absence, finding his homeland crushed under a satrap of the great king. The schools and temples were closed, the poets and sages had fled, like a cloud of swallows before Persian Caesarism. At least he had the comfort of gathering the last breath of his first master, Hermodamus, and finding his mother, Parsenis, the only one who had never doubted his return, for everyone else had believed in the death of the adventurer, the son of the jeweler of Samos. But she had never doubted the oracle of Apollo. She understood that under his white garments of an Egyptian priest, her son was preparing for a high mission. She knew that from the temple of night, Isis would emerge the benefactor master, the luminous prophet with whom she had dreamed in the sacred wood of Delphi, and that the Hierophant of Adonai had promised her under the cedars of Lebanon. 
and now a light boat sailed on the bluish waves of the Cyclades, this mother and child toward a new exile. They were fleeing with all their belongings. Samos, oppressed and lost, was weighing anchor for Greece. It was neither the Olympic crowns nor the laurels of the poet that attracted the son of Parsenis. His work was more mysterious and greater. To awaken the sleeping souls of the gods in the sanctuaries, to restore strength and prestige to the Temple of Apollo, and then to found somewhere a school of science and life from which would emerge not politicians and sophists, but initiated men and women, true mothers and pure heroes. The Temple of Delphi, the apologetic science, the theory of divination. The Pythia Theoclea of the Phocis Plain ascended towards the joyful meadows that bordered the banks of the Blistius, and then the traveller sank between the high mountains into a winding valley that narrowed further at every step. The country was grandiose and desolate. If he finally reached a circus of steep mountains crowned with wild peaks, a true funnel of electricity covered with frequent storms, suddenly at the end of the dark gorge, the city of Delphi appeared like an eagle's nest on its rock, surrounded by precipices and dominated by the two peaks of Parnassus. From afar, the victories and bronze horses shone, the countless gold statues arranged along the sacred way, lined up like a guard of heroes and gods around the Doric temple of Phoebus Apollo. This was the highest place in Greece. There the Pythia prophesied, there gathered the hosts. All the Hellenic peoples had erected chapels around the sanctuary that contained treasures of offerings. There, throngs of men, women and children from afar ascended the sacred way to greet the God of Light. Religion had consecrated Delphi to the veneration of the peoples since immemorial times. Its central location in Greece, its rock sheltered from raids and easy to defend, contributed to this. The place was well suited to excite the imagination. A particular feature gave it its prestige. In a cave behind the temple opened a fissure from which cold vapors escaped that were said to provoke inspiration and ecstasy. Plutarch recounts that in ancient times, a shepherd sitting at the edge of this fissure began to prophesy. Suddenly, he was thought to be mad, but when his predictions came true, attention was paid to him. The priests seized upon it and consecrated the place to the deity, hence the institution of the Pythia, who sat over the fissure on a tripod. The vapors rising from the abyss caused her convulsions, strange crises, and produced in her that second sight observed in notable cases of somnambulism. Aeschylus, whose assertions carry weight as he was the son of a priest of Eleusis and an initiate, tells us in the Eumenides through the voice of the Pythia that Delphi was first consecrated to the earth, then to Themis, Justice, then to Phoebe, the mediating moon, and finally to Apollo, the solar god. Each of these names represents long periods in the symbolism of the temples and extends over centuries. But the fame of Delphi dates back to Jupiter. The poets say, wishing to know the center of the earth, he sent forth two eagles from the east and the west, which met at Delphi. Whence this prestige, this universal and unquestioned authority that made Apollo the quintessential Greek god, which has retained an inexplicable radiance for us? History tells us nothing on this important point. Ask the orators, poets, philosophers, and they will only give you superficial explanations. The true answer to this question lies deep within the temple. Let us attempt to penetrate it. In Orphic thought, Dionysus and Apollo were two different revelations of the same divinity, Dionysus represented esoteric truth, the essence and interior of things, open only to the initiated. He contained the mysteries of life, past and future experiences, the relationships of the soul and body, heaven and earth. Apollo personified the same truth applied to earthly life and social order, inspirer of poetry, medicine and laws. He was science through divination, beauty through art, peace among peoples through justice, and harmony of body and soul through purification. In a word, for the initiate, Dionysus meant nothing less than the divine spirit evolving within him, and Apollo its manifestation in earthly man. <laughs> the priests had conveyed this to the people through a legend. They said that in the time of Orpheus, Bacchus and Apollo disputed the tripod of Delphi. Bacchus willingly ceded to his brother and withdrew to one of the peaks of Parnassus, where women celebrated his mysteries. In reality, the two great sons of Jupiter shared the empire of the world. One ruled over the mysterious beyond, the other over the living. Let us return then to find in Apollo the solar verb, the universal word, the great mediator, the Vishnu of the Indians, the Mithras of the Persians, 
the Horus of the Egyptians. But the old ideas of Asian esotericism took on in the legend of Apollo a plastic beauty, an incisive brilliance that penetrated more deeply into human consciousness, like the arrows of the god, serpents with white wings springing from his golden bow. Aeschylus says, Apollo bursts forth from the great night at Delphi. All the goddesses greet his birth. He walks, seizes the bow and the lyre, his locks float in the air, his quiver resonates upon his shoulders, and the sea trembles within him, and all the island shines from him in a bath of flames and gold. This is the epiphany of the divine light which, through its august presence, creates order, brilliance and harmony, of which poetry is a marvellous echo. The god goes to Delphi and pierces with his arrows a serpent monster that devastated the land. He heals the country and founds a temple, an image of the victory of this divine light over darkness and evil. In ancient religions, serpents symbolized both the fatal circle of life and the evil that results from it, and yet from this understood and dominated life arises knowledge. Apollo, serpent slayer, is the symbol of the initiate who pierces nature through science, dominates it through his will, and by breaking the fateful circle of flesh, allows the brilliance of the spirit to ascend while the broken pieces of human animality writhe in the sand. That is why Apollo is the master of expiations, of the purifications of soul and body, splashed with the blood of the monster. He has atoned, purified himself in an exile of eight years under the bitter and wholesome laurels of the Valley of Tempe. Apollo, educator of men, loves to dwell among them. He delights in cities among young men, in the struggles of poetry and in the palestra, but only temporarily. He lives among them. In autumn he returns to his homeland, to the land of the Hyperboreans, that mysterious people of luminous and transparent souls who live in the eternal dawn of perfect happiness. There are his true priests and beloved priestesses. He lives as he lives with them, in an intimate and profound community, and when he wishes to make a real gift to men, he brings from the land of the Hyperboreans one of those great luminous souls and descends it to earth to teach and enchant mortals. Meanwhile, he returns to Delphi every spring when the hymns are sung. He arrives visible to the initiates, alone in his Hyperborean whiteness, on a chariot drawn by melodious swans. He returns to dwell in the sanctuary where the Pythia conveys her oracles, where the sages and poets listen to her. Then the nightingales sing, the fountain of Castalia bubbles with great silver streams, the scents of dazzling light and heavenly music penetrate the heart of man and into the veins of nature. In this legend of the Hyperboreans, the esoteric foundation of the myth of Apollo shines forth in brilliant rays. The land of the Hyperboreans is the beyond, the empire of victorious souls whose astral dawns illuminate the multicolored zones. Apollo also personifies the immaterial and intangible light of which the sun is only a physical image and from which all truth flows. The wonderful swans that bring it to him are the poets, the seers, the geniuses, messengers of his great solar soul who leave behind shivers of light and melody. Hyperborean Apollo personifies the descent of heaven upon earth, the incarnation of spiritual beauty in blood and flesh, the influx of transcendent truth through inspiration and divination. But it is time to lift the golden veil of legends and penetrate into the very temple. How did divine action manifest within him? Let us touch here upon the arcanes of apologetic science and the mysteries of Delphi. In antiquity, a profound link united divination with solar cults. This is the golden key to all so-called magical mysteries. The worship of the Aryan man has been since the dawn of civilization, directed towards the sun as the source of light, heat, and life. But when the sages' thoughts rose beyond the phenomenon, they conceived behind this sensible fire and visible light an immaterial fire and an intelligible light. They identified the former with the virile principle, the creative spirit or the intellectual essence of the universe, and the latter with a feminine principle, its formative soul, its plastic substance. This intuition dates back to time immemorial, the conception in question intertwines with souls, mingles with the oldest mythologies. It circulates in medical signs in the form of acne. The universal fire that penetrates all things blooms in the religion of Zoroaster, where the cult of Mithras represents the esoteric part, Mithras being the male fire and Mitra the female light. Zoroaster formally states that the Eternal created through the living word the celestial light, the seed of Ormuz, the principle of material light and material fire. 
For the initiate, Mithras is merely a coarse reflection of this light in his dark cave, whose vault is painted with stars. He invokes the Son of Grace, the fire of love, conqueror of evil, reconciling Ormuz and Ariman, purifier and mediator who dwells in the souls of the saints. In the crypts of Egypt, initiates seek this same sun under the name of When You Sleep. They wish to contemplate the origin of things. They feel at first immersed in the ethereal waves of a delicious light where all living forms move. Then plunged into the darkness of dense matter, they hear a voice and in it recognize the voice of light. At the same time, a fire springs forth from the depths. Immediately, chaos organizes and clarifies. In the Egyptian Book of the Dead, souls struggle to reach this light in the bark of Isis. Moses fully adopted this doctrine. In Genesis, Elohim says, Let there be light, and there was light. Then, the creation of light precedes that of the sun and stars. This means that in terms of principles and cosmogony, intelligible light precedes material light. The Greeks, who fused human forms and dramatized the most abstract ideas, expressed the same doctrine in the myth of Hyperborean Apollo. Thus, the human spirit, through the internal contemplation of the universe, from the perspective of the soul and intelligence, was able to conceive an intelligible light, an imponderable element serving as an intermediary between matter and spirit. It would be easy to show that modern physicists have insensibly approached the same conclusion by an opposite path. That is, by seeking the constitution of matter and seeing the impossibility of explaining it by itself. In the 16th century, Paracelsus, while studying chemical combinations and the metamorphoses of bodies, began to admit a universal and hidden agent. From the way 17th and 18th century physicists conceived the universe as a dead machine, they believed in the absolute void of celestial spaces. However, when it was recognized that light is not the emission of a radiant matter, but the vibration of an imponderable element, it became necessary to admit that all space is filled with an infinitely subtle fluid that penetrates all bodies and through which waves of heat and light are transmitted. Thus one returned to the ideas of Greek physics and theosophy. Newton, who had spent his entire life studying the movements of celestial bodies, went further. He called this ether sensorium DEI, or the brain of God, meaning the organ through which divine thought acts in the infinitely great as in the infinitely small. By putting forth this idea that he deemed necessary to explain the simple rotation of the stars, this great physicist immersed himself in a full esoteric philosophy, the ether that Newton's thought found in the spaces he had only found at the bottom of his alembics and had called light. This subtle and indispensable agent, this light invisible to our eyes, but which is at the heart of all scintillations and all phosphorescences, was discovered by a German physicist in a series of carefully arranged experiments, Rachel Bash noted that subjects with a very sensitive nerve fiber placed in a perfectly dark room in front of a magnet saw at its two ends strong rays of red, yellow, and blue light. These rays sometimes vibrated with a wavy motion. He continued his experiments with all kinds of bodies, especially crystals. Around all these bodies, sensitive subjects saw luminous emanations around their heads. Men placed in the dark room saw white rays from their fingers and small flames. In the first phase of their sleep, somnambulists sometimes see a magnetizer with these same signs. Pure astral light only appears in high ecstasy, but it polarizes in all bodies, combines with all earthly fluids and animal magnetism. Rave called this fluid, or his work was translated into English by Gregory, presents on magnetism, electroesthetics, and chemical attraction, London, 1850. The interest of Rakenbash's experiments lies in having touched the limits and transition from physical vision to astral vision, which can lead to spiritual vision. They also hint at the infinite refinements of imponderable matter. In this way, nothing prevents us from conceiving it as a fluid, subtle and penetrating, that it becomes somewhat homogeneous with the spirit and serves as a perfect garment. We have just seen that modern physics had to recognize an imponderable universal agent to explain the world. It has demonstrated its existence and thus, without knowing it, has entered into the ancient philosophical ideas. Let us now attempt to define the nature and function of the cosmic fluid according to the philosophy of the occult throughout all times. For regarding this capital principle of cosmogony, Zoroaster concurs with Heraclitus, Pythagoras with Saint Paul, 
the Kabbalists with Paracelsus. Everywhere reigns Sibele, the great soul of the world, the vibrating and plastic substance that wields at will the breath of the creative spirit. Her ethereal oceans serve as cement between all worlds. She is the great mediator between the invisible and the visible, between spirit and matter, between the internal and external of the universe, condensed into enormous masses in the atmosphere. Under the attraction of the sun, she bursts forth in lightning. Drunk by the earth, magnetic currents circulate through her, subtle in the nervous system of the animal. She transmits her will to the limbs and her sensations to the brain. Moreover, this subtle fluid forms living organisms similar to material bodies, for it serves as the substance of the astral body of the soul, a luminous garment that the spirit continually weaves for itself according to the souls it dresses, according to the worlds it envelops. This fluid transforms, refines, or condenses. It incorporates not only the spirit and does not normalize matter, but it also reflects within its animated being the things, wills, and human thoughts in its perpetual mirage. The strength and duration of these images are proportional to the intensity of the will that produces them, and in truth, there is no other way to explain suggestion and the transmission of thought at a distance. This principle of magic that today exists and is recognized by science. See the Bulletin of the Society of Physiological Psychology, presided over by Mr. Charcot, 1885. Especially see the beautiful book by Mr. Robix on Mental Suggestion, Paris, 1887. Thus the past of worlds trembles in the astral light in uncertain images, and the future walks among them with the living souls that the inevitable destiny forces to descend. Here is the meaning of the veil of Isis and the mantle of Sibylle in which all beings are woven. It is now evident that the theosophical doctrine of astral light is identical to the secret doctrine of the solar verb in the religions of the East and Greece. One can also see how this doctrine connects with that of divination. Astral light reveals itself as the universal means of vision and ecstasy phenomena and explains them. It is both the vehicle that transmits the movements of thought and the living mirror in which the soul contemplates the images of the material and spiritual world. Once the element is transported here, the spirit of the seer leaves the corporeal conditions. The measure of time and space changes for him. He participates in some way in the ubiquity of the universal fluid. Opaque matter becomes transparent to him, and the soul disaggregating from the body, rising in its own light, reaches through ecstasy into the spiritual world, sees the souls clad in their ethereal bodies, and communicates with them. All the ancient initiates had a clear idea of this second sight or direct vision of the spirit. The witness Aeschylus has the shade of Straton say, Look at these wounds, your spirit can see them. The spirit, when it sleeps, has eyes more penetrating than in the daylight. Mortals cannot encompass a vast field with their sight. Let us add that this theory of clairvoyance and ecstasy harmonizes perfectly with the numerous scientific experiments conducted by scholars and doctors of this century, on all kinds of lucid and clairvoyant somnambulists. There is an abundant literature on this subject of very uneven value in France, Germany and England. We will cite two works where these questions are treated scientifically by trustworthy men. The first is Leathers on Animal and Magnetism by William Gregory London. Gregory was a professor of chemistry at the University of Edinburgh. His book is a thorough study of the phenomena of animal magnetism, from suggestion to distant vision and lucid clairvoyance, on subjects observed by himself according to the scientific method and with meticulous accuracy. The second is Die 16 Monate by a professor of philosophy and medicine from the University of Bern. His book offers an intense repertoire of all occult phenomena with some historical value with a very remarkable chapter on clairvoyance. This first volume contains 20 stories of somnambulists and five stories of somnambulists recounted by the doctors who treated them. The case of the clairvoyant winner treated by the author is one of the most curious. See also the treatises on magnetism by Dupotter Thales and the very interesting treatise by Justine Corner. Taking these contemporary facts into account, let us briefly characterize the succession of psychic states from simple clairvoyance to cataleptic ecstasy. The state of clairvoyance, as inferred from thousands of well-verified facts, is a psychic state that differs from both sleep and wakefulness. Instead of diminishing the faculties of the clairvoyant, these faculties increase astonishingly. His memory is more precise. 
his imagination livelier, his intelligence more awake. Finally, and this is a crucial fact, a new sense that is no longer a bodily sense, but a sense of the soul has developed. Not only do the thoughts of the magnetizer transmit to him, like in the simple phenomenon of suggestion that transcends the physical plane, but the clairvoyant reads the thoughts of those present at the experience. He sees through walls, penetrates entities at distances he has never gone, and into the intimate lives of people he does not know. His eyes are closed, and he cannot see anything, but his mind sees farther and better than his open eyes, and he seems to travel freely in space. There are many examples in Gregory, letters 16, 17 and 18. In a word, if clairvoyance is an abnormal state from the perspective of the body, it is a normal and superior state from the perspective of the spirit, as his consciousness has become deeper, his vision broader. The self continues to be the same, but it has moved to a higher plane where its gaze, freed from the gross organs of the body, embraces and penetrates a vaster horizon. The German philosopher recognized the capital importance of somnambulism in the question of the immortality of the soul. He observes that in lucid sleep, a relative elevation and liberation of the soul from the body occurs as never happens in the normal state. In somnambulists, everything indicates an elevated consciousness, as if their entire being were concentrated in a luminous focus that unites the past, present and future. Far from losing memory, the past illuminates for them. The future even reveals itself sometimes in a considerable ray. If this is possible in earthly life, Shalin asks, is it not true that our spiritual personality, which follows us in death, is already present in us in an actual way, that it is not born then, but is simply freed? It shows itself at the moment it is not bound to the external world by the senses. The post-mortem state is therefore more real than the earthly state, for in this life, the accident, by mingling with everything, paralyzes in us the essential. Shalin simply calls the future state clairvoyance. The spirit, stripped of everything accidental in earthly life, becomes livelier and stronger. The malevolent becomes more malevolent, the good becomes better. Recently, Mr. Charles has supported the same thesis with a wealth of facts and viewpoints in a magnificent book, Philosophy and Mysticism, 1886. He starts from this fact. The consciousness of the self does not exhaust its object. The soul and consciousness are not two adequate terms. They do not overlap, as they do not have the same extension. The sphere of the soul far exceeds that of consciousness. There is therefore in us a latent self. This latent self, which manifests in dreams and drowsiness, is the true supraterrestrial and transcendent self, whose existence preceded our earthly self, tied to the body. The earthly self is perishable. The transcendent self is immortal. This is why St. Paul said, from this earth we walk towards heaven. It should be noted that some somnambulists, when undergoing the passes of the magnetizer, feel themselves flooded with an ever more dazzling light, while waking brings them a painful return to darkness. Suggestion, thought reading and remote viewing are facts that already prove the independent existence of the soul and transport us to the physical plane of the universe without completely taking us out of it. However, clairvoyance has infinite varieties and a much broader scale of diverse states than that of consciousness. As one ascends, the phenomena become rarer and more extraordinary. Let us mention only the main stages. Retrocognition is a vision of past events preserved in the astral light and revived by the sympathy of the clairvoyant. True divination is a problematic vision of future things, either through introspection of the thoughts of the living that contain in germ the future actions, or through the hidden influence of higher spirits that develop the future in vivid images before the soul of the clairvoyant. In both cases, it involves projections of thoughts into the astral light. Finally, ecstasy is defined as a vision of the spiritual world where good or evil spirits appear to the clairvoyant in human form and communicate with him. The soul seems to be genuinely transported outside the body, whose life is almost departed, and which is in a cataleptic state close to death. Nothing can match, according to the accounts of great statics, the beauty and brilliance of these visions, nor the feeling of an ineffable fusion with the divine essence they bring, like an intoxication of light and music. One may doubt the reality of these visions, but it is necessary to add that if, in the average state of clairvoyance, the soul has an accurate perception of distant places and absent individuals, 
it is logical to admit that in its highest degree of exaltation, it may have the vision of a higher and immaterial reality. In our view, it will be the task of the future to restore to the transcendent faculties of the human soul its dignity and social function by reorganizing them under the supervision of science and on the foundations of a true religion, open to all truths. Then science, regenerated by true faith and the spirit of charity, will reach with open eyes those spheres where speculative philosophy wanders, blindfolded and groping. If science becomes clairvoyant and redemptive, as its consciousness and love for humanity increase, perhaps it will be through the door of dreams and visions, as the old Homer said, that the divine psyche, banished from our civilization and weeping silently under its veil, will reclaim possession of its altars. In any case, the phenomena of clairvoyance observed in all their phases by scholars and doctors of the century cast new light on the role of divination in antiquity and on a multitude of seemingly supernatural phenomena contained in the annals of all peoples. Certainly it is essential to delineate the share that might belong to legend and history, to illusion or to true vision, but the experimental psychology of our time teaches us not to outright reject facts that are as human in nature as possible, and to study them from the perspective of established laws. If clairvoyance is a faculty of the soul, it is no longer legitimate to reject outright the prophets, oracles and civilizations into the realm of superstition. Divination may have been known and practiced in the ancient temples with fixed principles, with a social and religious purpose. The comparative study of religions and esoteric traditions shows that these principles were the same everywhere, although their application varied infinitely. What has discredited the art of divination is that its corruption has led to the worst abuses and its beautiful manifestations are only possible among beings of great purity and high elevation of the soul. Divination, as it was practiced at Delphi, was based on the principles we have just outlined and the internal organization of the temple corresponded to this. Like in the great temples of Egypt, it consisted of an art and a science. The art consisted of penetrating the distant, the past and the future through clairvoyance or prophetic ecstasy. The science calculated the future according to the laws of universal evolution. Art and science verified each other mutually. We will say nothing of this science called genealogy by the ancients, of which medieval astrology is but a misunderstood fragment, unless it presupposes the esoteric encyclopedia applied to the future of peoples and individuals. Very useful as guidance, it has always been very problematic in its application, and only first-rate minds have known how to use it. Pythagoras had explored it in Egypt. In Greece, divination was practiced with less complete and less precise data. On the contrary, the art of clairvoyance and prophecy had developed quite far. It is known that this art was practiced at Delphi by young and old women called Pythia or Pythonesses, who played the passive role of clairvoyant somnambulists. The priests interpreted, translated, and often adjusted their confused oracles according to their own insights. Modern historians have seen in the institution of Delphi little more than the exploitation of superstitions by intelligent charlatanism. However, beyond the consensus of all ancient philosophy regarding the divinatory science of Delphi, several oracles reported by Herodotus, such as the decrees and those concerning the Battle of Salamis, plead in its favor. Undoubtedly, this art had its principle, its flourishing and its decline. Charlatanism and corruption ultimately mingled with it. Witness King Cleomenes, who corrupted the superior priestess of Delphi to deprive Demaratus of his throne. Plutarch wrote a treatise to investigate the reasons for the decline of the oracles, and this degeneration was felt as a misfortune by the entire ancient society. In the preceding era, divination was cultivated with religious sincerity and scientific depth, that elevated it to the rank of a true priesthood. One could read the following inscription on the temple façade, Know thyself and this one above the entrance door. Let no one approach here who is impure. These words told those who arrived that earthly passions, lies and hypocrisies should not cross the threshold of the sanctuary, and that within divine truth reigned with a formidable majesty. Pythagoras did not go to Delphi until after visiting all the temples, stopping with Epimenides in the sanctuary of Jupiter, attending the Olympic Games, presiding over the Eleusinian mysteries where the Hierophant had ceded his seat to him. Everywhere he had been welcomed as a master, and he awaited him at Delphi. The divinatory art was languishing, and Pythagoras wanted to restore its depth 
strength, and prestige. He was therefore going to this sanctuary rather to enlighten its interpreters than to consult Apollo. He intended to ignite their enthusiasm and awaken their energy, directing them meant directing the soul of Greece and preparing its future. Fortunately, he found in the temple a marvellous instrument that seemed to have been reserved for him by providential design. The young Theoclea belonged to the College of Priestesses of Apollo, coming from one of those families where the priestly dignity was hereditary. The great impressions of the sanctuary, the ceremonies of worship, the choirs, the festivals of mythic and hyperborean Apollo, had nourished her childhood. One can imagine her as one of those young women who have an innate and untimely receptivity to what attracts others. They do not love beings and fear Venus, for the heavy earthly atmosphere worries them, and physical love, vaguely glimpsed, seems to them a violation of the soul, a rupture of their intact and virginal being. On the contrary, they are strangely sensitive to mysterious currents and astral influences. When the moon illuminated the dark groves of the spring of Castalia, Theoclea saw whitish forms slipping there in broad daylight and heard voices. When she exposed herself to the rays of the rising sun, its vibration immersed her in a kind of ecstasy where she heard invisible choirs. Nevertheless, she was very insensitive to the popular idolatries of worship. The statues left her indifferent, and she loathed animal sacrifices. She did not speak to anyone about the apparitions that troubled her sleep. She sensed with the instinct of the clairvoyance that the priests of Apollo did not possess the light, the supreme light they needed. However, they fixed their gaze on her to persuade her to become a pythoness. She felt drawn to a higher world for which she did not have the key, those gods who seized her and shook her. She wanted to know it before surrendering, for great souls need to see clearly, even while surrendering to divine powers. What profound tremor, what mysterious premonition must have stirred the soul of Theoclea when she first saw Pythagoras and heard his voice resonating among the columns of the sanctuary. Then she felt the presence of the initiator who awaited her, she recognized her desire for knowledge. She would learn from him and would make this inner world, the world she carried within her, speak. He, for his part, must have recognized in her, with the certainty and insight of a single glance, the living and vibrating soul he sought to be the interpreter of his thought in the temple and to breathe a new spirit into it. From the first exchanged glance, from the first spoken word, an invisible chain united the sage of Samos with the young priestess, who listened to him silently, drinking in his words with her large, attentive eyes. I do not know who said that the poet and the lyre recognize each other in a deep vibration as they approach one another. Thus, Pythagoras and Theoclea recognized each other. From dawn, Pythagoras had long conferences with the priests of Apollo, called saints and prophets. He requested that the young priestess be admitted to initiate her into his secret teaching and prepare her for her role. She was thus able to attend the lessons the master gave every day in the sanctuary. Pythagoras was then in the prime of life, dressed in his white robe, belted in the Egyptian manner. A band of purple encircled his broad forehead. When he spoke, his grave and slow eyes rested on his interlocutor, enveloping him in a chalice of light. The air around him seemed to become lighter and more intellectual. All the conferences of the sage of Samos with the highest representatives of Greek religion, were of extreme importance. It was not only about divination and inspiration, but about the future of Greece and the destinies of the whole world. The knowledge, titles and powers he had acquired in the temples of Memphis and Babylon gave him the greatest authority. He had the right to speak as a superior and as a guide of the inspirers, doing so with the eloquence of his genius and the enthusiasm of his mission. To enlighten their understanding, he began by recounting his youth, his struggles, his Egyptian initiation. He spoke to them of that Egypt, the mother of Greece, as old as the world, unchanging like a mummy covered in hieroglyphs at the bottom of its pyramids, but possessing in its tomb the secret of peoples, languages, and religions. He unfolded before their eyes the mysteries of the great Isis, earthly and celestial, mother of gods and men, and by putting them through her trials he immersed them in the light of Osiris. Then it was the turn of Babylon, with its Chaldean magicians, its occult sciences, its deep and massive temples where they evoked the living fire in which gods and demons move. While listening to Pythagoras, Theoclea experienced surprising sensations. 
Everything he said inscribed itself in letters of fire in her mind. These things seemed both wonderful and familiar to her. In learning them, she felt she was rediscovering them. The master's words made her leaf through the pages of the universe like a book. She no longer saw the gods in their human effigies, but in their essences that formed things and spirits. She rose, ascended, and descended with them in space. Sometimes she had the illusion of not feeling the limits of her body and dissolving into the infinite. In this way, the imagination gradually entered the invisible world, and the ancient traces she found in her own soul told her that this was the true, the only reality. The rest was mere appearance. She felt that soon her inner eyes would open to read directly from those heights. The master brought her back to earth by recounting the misfortunes Egypt was enduring. After expounding on the greatness of Egyptian science, he showed how it had succumbed under the Persian invasion, painting the horrors of Cambyses, the plundered temples, the sacred books thrown into the fire, the priests of Osiris dead or scattered, and the monster of Persian despotism that gathered under its iron hand all the old Asian barbarism, the race of the half-savage Sarmatians from the center of Asia and the depths of India, waiting only for a favorable opportunity to launch upon Europe. Yes, this growing cyclone was to strike Greece as surely as lightning must flash from the clouds that gather in the air. Was divided, Greece prepared to withstand this terrible shock. It did not even suspect it. Peoples do not avoid their destiny, and if they do not remain vigilant, the gods precipitate them. Had not the wise nation of Hermes Egypt collapsed after six thousand years of prosperity? Alas, beautiful Greece would pass even faster. The day would come when the solar god would abandon this temple, the barbarians would tear down its stones, and shepherds would lead their flocks over the ruins of Delphi. At these grim prophecies, Theoclea's face transformed, taking on an expression of fear. She fell to the ground, clinging to a column, her eyes fixed, plunged in her thoughts. She seemed to be the genius of pain, weeping over the future and gloomy tomb of Greece. Pythagoras continued, These are secrets that must be buried deep in the temples. The initiate attracts death or repels it at will, forming the magical chain of wills. Initiates also prolong the lives of peoples. Within you is the power to delay the fateful, within you to make Greece shine, to radiate in it the word. Peoples are those who make their gods, but the gods reveal themselves only to those who invoke them. What is Apollo? The word of the one God who eternally manifests itself in the world. Truth is the soul of God, its body is light. The wise, the seers, the prophets see it. Men see only its shadow. The glorified spirits that we call heroes and demigods dwell in this light, in legions, in countless spheres. This is the true body of Apollo, the son of initiates, and without its rays, nothing great happens on earth. Just as a magnet attracts iron, so through our thoughts, our prayers, our actions, we attract divine inspiration transmitted by Greece, the word of Apollo, and Greece will shine with an immortal light. Through such speeches, Pythagoras succeeded in awakening in the priests of Apollo the awareness of their mission. Theoclea absorbed his ideas with silent and focused passion. She was transforming visibly under the thought and will of the master, as if under a slow enchantment. Amid the amazed ancients, she let down her black hair and parted it from her forehead, as if she felt fire coursing through it. Her open and transfigured eyes seemed to contemplate the solar and planetary geniuses in their radiant orbs and intense radiation. One day, she fell into a deep and lucid sleep of her own accord. The five prophets surrounded her, but she remained unresponsive to their voices and touches. Pythagoras approached her and said, Get up and go where my thought sends you, for now you are the Pythia. At the voice of the master, a shiver ran through her whole body, lifting her into a long vibration. Her eyes were closed, she saw inwardly. Where are you? asked Pythagoras. I am rising, I am continuously rising, and now I swim in the light of Orpheus. What do you see in the future? Great wars, bronze men, victories. Apollo returns to dwell in his sanctuary, and I will be his voice. But you, his messenger or misfortune, will you leave me and carry his light to Italy? The seer spoke at length, her eyes closed, with her musical, breathless, rhythmic voice, then suddenly, with a sob, she fell, as if dead. In this way, Pythagoras transmitted pure teachings into Theoclea's mind, and tempered her with a lyre for the breath. 
Once exalted to this height of inspiration, she became for him a torch through which he could probe his own destiny, penetrate the possible future, and steer toward the limitless realms of the invisible. This thrilling countertest of the truths he taught admired the priests, awakened their enthusiasm, and revived their faith. The temple now had an inspired Pythia, priests initiated in the sciences and divine arts. Delphi could again become a center of life and action. Pythagoras remained there for a whole year, and only after instructing the priests in all the secrets of his doctrine and training Theoclea for her ministry did he leave for the great order and doctrine. The city of Croton occupied the end of the Gulf of Taranto, near the promontory of Chiniano, facing the open sea. Together with Sybaris, it was the most flourishing city of southern Italy. It had the reputation of its Doric constitution, its victorious athletes at the Olympic Games, and its physicians rivaling the Asclepiads. The Sybarites owed their immortality to their luxury and easy life. The Cretonians might have been forgotten despite their virtues had they not had the glory of offering asylum to the great school of esoteric philosophy known as the Pythagorean sect, which can be considered the mother of the Platonic school and the ancestor of all idealist schools. However noble their descendants may be, it far surpasses the Platonic school which emerged from incomplete initiation. The historical school has already lost the true tradition. Other systems of ancient and modern philosophy are merely more or less successful speculations, while the doctrine of Pythagoras was based on experimental science and accompanied by a complete organization of life. With the ruins of the vanished city, the secrets of the order and the thought of the master are today deeply buried underground. Let us, however, try to bring them back to life. They will provide us with an opportunity to penetrate to the heart of philosophical doctrine, the arcana of religions and philosophies, and to lift a corner of the veil of Isis to the clarity of the Greek genius. Several reasons led Pythagoras to choose this Doric colony as a center of action. His goal was not only to teach esoteric doctrine to a circle of chosen disciples, but also to apply his principles to the education of youth and the life of the state. Here, the plan included the foundation of an institute for lay initiation, with the secondary intention of gradually transforming the political organization of cities to reflect this philosophical ideal. It is true that none of the republics of the Ella of O or the Peloponnese would have tolerated such an innovation. They would have accused the philosopher of conspiring against the state. The Greek cities of the Gulf of Taranto, less eroded by demagogy, were more liberal. Pythagoras was not mistaken in hoping to find a favorable reception for his reforms in the Senate of Croton. Furthermore, his intentions extended beyond Greece. Sensing the evolution of ideas, he foresaw the fall of Hellenism and sought to deposit the principles of a scientific religion in the human spirit. By founding his school in the Gulf of Taranto, he spread esoteric ideas throughout Italy and preserved in the precious vessel of his doctrine the purified essence of Eastern wisdom for the peoples of the West. Upon arriving in Croton, which was then inclined toward the voluptuous life of its neighbor Sybaris, Pythagoras initiated a true revolution. Porphyry and Ammonius portray his principles as those of a mage rather than those of a philosopher. He gathered the youth in the temple of Apollo and succeeded through his eloquence in pulling them away from vice. He assembled the women in the temple of Juno and persuaded them to wear their golden robes and ornaments, this same temple as trophies of the defeat of vanity and luxury. He wrapped the austerity of his teachings in grace. A communicative flame emanated from his wisdom, the beauty of his face, the nobility of his person, the charm of his physiognomy, and his voice began to captivate women. They compared him to Jupiter and the youth to Apollo. Hyperbore attracted, led the multitude, who were very pleased to listen to him, to fall in love with virtue and truth. The Senate of Croton, or the Council of the Thousand, worried about this influence and compelled Pythagoras to justify his behavior and the means he employed to dominate minds. This was an opportunity for him to develop his ideas on evolution and demonstrate that, far from threatening the Doric constitution of Croton, they would only affirm it. Once he had won over the wealthiest citizens and the majority of the Senate to his project, he proposed the creation of an institute for himself and his disciples. This brotherhood of lay initiates would live communally in a building constructed for this purpose, but without separating from civil life. 
those among them who already deserved the title of masters could teach physical, psychic, and religious sciences. As for the youth, they would be admitted to the master's lessons and to the various degrees of initiation according to their intelligence and goodwill under the supervision of the head of the order. To start, they had to submit to the rules of communal life and spend the whole day in the institute, monitored by the masters. Those who wished to formally enter the order had to relinquish their fortune to a curator, with the freedom to return to enjoy it whenever they wished. In the institute, there was a section for women with a parallel initiation that was differentiated and adapted to the duties of their gender. Here, the project was enthusiastically adopted by the Senate of Cretone, and after a few years, a building surrounded by vast porticos and beautiful gardens rose in the vicinity of the city. The Cretonians called it the Temple of the Muses, and indeed, at the center of these buildings near the master's modest chamber, there was a temple dedicated to these deities, Thus was born the Pythagorean Institute, which became both an educational college, an academy of sciences, and a small model city under the guidance of a great initial master. Through theory and practice, through the sciences and the arts combined, it slowly achieved that science of sciences, that magical harmony of the soul and intellect with the universe, which the Pythagoreans regarded as the arcane of philosophy and religion. The Pythagorean school holds supreme interest for us, as it was the most remarkable attempt at secular initiation, an anticipated synthesis of Hellenism and Christianity. It grafted the fruit of science onto the tree of life. It recognized this internal and living realization of truth that can only provide profound faith, an ephemeral realization, but of crucial importance, that had the fertility of example to form an idea. Let us penetrate into the Pythagorean Institute and follow step by step the initiation of the novice, the trial shone on a hill among the cypresses and olive trees, the white dwelling of initiated humans. From there, along the coast, its porticos, gardens and gymnasium could be distinguished. The Temple of the Muses raised its circular colonnade of elegance on the two wings of the building. From the terrace of the outer gardens, one overlooked the city with its citadel, its port and its assembly square. In the distance, the gulf revealed itself between the steep shores like a cup of agate, and the Ionian Sea closed the horizon with its blue line. Sometimes, women dressed in various costumes would emerge from the left wing of the building, descending in long lines toward the sea along the Cyprus path to perform their rites at the Temple of the Beings. Often, men in white togas would ascend from the right wing toward the Temple of Apollo. It was no small attraction for the curious image of youth to think that the school of initiates was placed under the protection of these two deities. One, the great goddess containing the profound mysteries of woman and the earth, and the other, the solar god, revealing those of man and the sky. Thus it shone resplendently above the populated city, the little city of the elect, its tranquil serenity attracting the noble instincts of youth. Nothing else was visible to those passing inside, and it was known that it was not easy to be admitted. A simple living hedge surrounded the gardens of the Pythagorean Institute, the entrance gate was open during the day, but there stood a statue of Hermes, and it read on its base, Be pure, profane ones. Everyone respected the mandate of the mysteries. Admission was extremely difficult for novices, Pythagoras saying that not every wood serves to make a mercury. Young men who wished to join the association had to undergo a period of testing and trial. Presented by their parents or by one of the masters, they were allowed to enter the Pythagorean gymnasium, where novices engaged in games of their age. The young man noticed at first glance that this gymnasium was unlike that of the city. No violent shouts, no noisy groups, no ridiculous boasting, no vain display of the strength of blossoming athletes challenging one another and showcasing their muscles, but groups of refined and distinguished young men strolling in pairs under the porticos or playing in the sand, inviting him gracefully and simply to join their conversation as if he were one of them without looking down at him with suspicious glances or mocking smiles. In the sand they practiced running, throwing the javelin and the discus. They also performed simultaneous combats in the form of Dorian dances, but Pythagoras had strictly banned from his institute wrestling, saying that it was superfluous and dangerous, developing pride and hatred. Men destined to practice the virtues of friendship should not start by fighting each other and rolling in the sand like wild beasts. A true hero should know how to fight with courage but without fury, 
for hatred makes us inferior to any opponent. The newcomer today respected these maxims of the master, admired by the novices proud to share their early wisdom with him, while being encouraged to express their opinions and to contradict freely. Mm. Encouraged by them, the innocent candidate quickly revealed his true nature, happy to be listened to and admired. But he prayed and flourished at will. Meanwhile, the masters observed him closely without ever correcting him. Pythagoras arrived unexpectedly to study his gestures and words, paying special attention to the demeanor and laughter of the youth. Laughter, he said, manifests character in an indisputable way, and no disciple should embellish the laughter of a malicious person. There was a fact, such a deep study of human physiognomy, that he could read the depths of the soul, its origins. It is claimed that Pythagoras was the inventor of physiognomy. Through these meticulous observations, the master formed a precise idea of his future disciples. After a few months, the decisive tests arrived, which were imitations of Greek initiation but less severe and adapted to the Greek nature, whose impressionability would not have borne the deadly terrors of the crypts of Memphis and Thebes. The aspirant would spend the night in a cave near the city, where it was said there were monsters and apparitions. Those who did not have the strength to endure the gloomy impressions of solitude and night, who refused to enter or fled before morning, were deemed too weak for initiation and dismissed. The moral trial was more serious. Suddenly, without preparation, one morning they would lock the disciple in a sad, bare cell, leaving him with a slate and coldly ordering him to search for the meaning of one of the Pythagorean symbols. For example, what does the triangle inscribed in the circle mean? Or why does the dodecahedron encompass the sphere and is the number of the universe? He would spend twelve hours in the cell with his slate and problem, with no other company than a glass of water and a dry bread. Then he would be taken into a room before the gathered novices. In these circumstances, he was ordered to mock mercilessly the unfortunate soul who, in a bad mood and hungry, presented himself before them as a guilty party. Look, they would say to the new philosopher, what an inspired face. He is going to tell us about his meditations. Don't hide from us what you have discovered. In this way, he would meditate on all the symbols. When he had endured this regimen for a month, he would see how he would become a great sage. It was precisely at that moment that the master observed with deep attention the attitude and physiognomy of the young man. Irritated by fasting, filled with sarcasm, humiliated by not having been able to solve the problem, an enigma incomprehensible to him, he would have to make a great effort to dominate himself. Some cried in rage, others responded with cynical words, others beside themselves would break their slates in fury, filling the master, the school, and the disciples with insults. Pythagoras would then appear and calmly say that, having poorly endured the trial of self-esteem, he asked it not to return to a school of which he had such a low opinion, where the fundamental virtues should be friendship and respect for the masters. The expelled candidate would leave, shamefaced, and sometimes become a formidable enemy of the order, like the infamous Cylon, who later incited the people against the Pythagoreans and provoked the catastrophe of the order. In contrast, those who faced attacks with firmness, who responded to provocations with just and witty words, and declared that they were ready to begin the trial a hundred times to obtain a single fragment of wisdom, were the only ones admitted to the novitiate and received the enthusiastic congratulations of the newcomers along with the first-degree disciples, preparing for the novitiate and the Pythagorean life. Only then did the novitiate begin, called preparation or for scar, which lasted at least two years and could extend up to five years. The novices or listeners, that is, those who submitted to the readings they received, were subjected to the absolute rule of silence. They were not allowed to object to their masters or to argue. They had to receive these teachings with respect and meditate long on them. To instill this rule in the mind of the new listener, they were shown a statue of a woman enveloped in a large veil with a finger on her lips. The Muse of Silence. Pythagoras did not believe that youth was capable of understanding the origin and end of things. He thought that training youth in dialectics and reasoning before giving them the sense of truth only formed empty heads and pretentious sophists. He believed that, above all, one must develop in them the primordial and superior faculty of man, intuition. For this, he did not teach mysterious or difficult things, but started from natural feelings and the first duties of man upon entering life, 
showing their relationship with universal laws. He first instilled in the young the love of their parents, enlarging this feeling by equating the idea of the father with that of God, the great creator of the universe. Nothing is more venerable, he said, than the quality of father. Homer called Jupiter the king of the gods, but to show all his greatness, he calls him the father of gods and men. He compared the mother to generous and benevolent nature, as heavenly Sibylle produces the stars, and as Demeter brings forth the fruits and flowers of the earth. Thus, the mother nourishes the child with all joys. The child must therefore honor his mother and father as earthly representations of these great divinities. He also showed that the love one bears for the homeland arises from the love felt in childhood for the mother. Parents are not given by chance, as the vulgar believe, but by a preceding and superior order called fortune or necessity, and it is imperative to honor them. As for friends, it is necessary to choose them wisely. Novices were advised to group themselves two by two, according to their affinities. The younger should find in the elder the virtues he seeks, and the two companions should encourage each other toward a better life. The friend is another self. It is necessary to honor him as a god, the master said. If the Pythagorean rule imposed absolute submission on the novice listener, it granted the masters their full freedom in the charm of friendship, which was the stimulant of all virtues, the poetry of life, the path to the ideal. Individual energies were thus awakened, morality became alive and poetic, the rule accepted with love ceased to be a violence and became the affirmation of a personality. Pythagoras wanted obedience to be a feeling, but moral teaching prepared for philosophical teaching, for the relationships established between social duties and the harmonies of the cosmos foreshadowed the law of analogies and universal concordances. In this law resides the principle of the mysteries of hidden doctrine and all philosophy. The disciple's mind became accustomed to finding the trace of an invisible order in visible reality. General maxims, prescriptions, their ribbons, had perspectives on this higher world. Morning and evening, the golden verses resonated in the disciples' ear with the accents of the lyre dedicated to the immortal gods. Hold firmly to your faith. In commenting on this maxim, it was taught that the gods, differing in appearance, were in reality the same among all peoples, as they corresponded to the same active intellectual and spiritual forces throughout the universe. In the sacred grove, they gathered around the master or his interpreters, and the lesson extended under the freshness of the great trees or the shade of the porticos at noon. A prayer was directed toward the heroes, the benevolent spirits. The esoteric tradition assumed that good spirits preferred to approach the earth with solar radiation, while evil spirits frequented the shadows and spread through the atmosphere with the night. The frugal midday meal generally consisted of bread, honey and olives. The afternoon was devoted to gymnastic exercises, followed by study, meditation, and mental work on the morning lesson. After sunset, they prayed together, singing a hymn to the cosmogonic gods, to celestial Jupiter, to Minerva Providence, and to Diana, protector of the dead. Meanwhile, incense burned on the open-air altar, and the hymn, mingled with the fragrance, rose gently into the twilight as the first stars pierced the pale blue. The day ended with the evening meal, after which the youngest read a book, commenting on what he thought of it. Thus flowed the Pythagorean day clear as a brook, bright as a cloudless morning. The year was marked by the great astronomical festivals, the return of Hyperborean Apollo and the celebration of the mysteries of Ceres brought together novices and initiates of all degrees, men and women. One could see young people playing the ivory lyre, married women in purple and saffron tunics performing choruses accompanied by songs with the harmonious movements of the strophe and antistrophe which later imitated tragedy in the midst of these great festivals where divinity seemed present in the grace of forms and movements in the incisive melody of the choruses the novice had a kind of premonition of the hidden forces of all the powerful laws of the universe animated by the deep and transparent sky Weddings and funeral rituals had a more intimate, yet no less solemn character. An original ceremony provided the basis for the work of the imagination. When a novice voluntarily left the institute to continue his ordinary life, or when a disciple had betrayed a secret of the doctrine, which had occurred only once. The initiates erected a tomb for him in the sacred enclosure, as if he were dead. The master would say, He is more dead than the dead since he has returned to a vile life. 
His body walks among men, but his soul is dead, let us mourn it. This tomb raised for a living man pursued him like his own ghost and like a sinister omen. The second degree, purification or catharsis in Greek. The numbers, the theogony. It was a happy day. A golden day, as the ancients said, the day when Pythagoras received the novice into his home and solemnly accepted him as his disciple. To begin with, direct and continuous relationships with the master were established. One entered the inner courtyard of his chamber reserved for his faithful. Hence the name of esoteric, or those from the inside, opposed to exoteric, or those from the outside. The true and transcendent initiation then began. This revelation consisted of a complete and reasoned exposition of the hidden doctrine, from its principles contained in the mysterious science of numbers to the ultimate consequences of universal evolution in the destinies and ultimate ends of the divine psyche of the human soul. This science of numbers was known by various names in the temples of Egypt and Asia, for it provided the key to all doctrine. The letters, geometric figures or human representations that served as signs for this algebra of the hidden world were understood only by the initiate. Pythagoras formulated this science in a book written by his hand, called Hieros Logos, the Sacred Word. This book has not survived to us, but later writings of the Pythagoreans, Heraclitus, the Dialogues of Plato, the treatises of Aristotle, Porphyry, and Iamblichus allow us to know its principles. If they are a dead letter for modern philosophers, it is because one can understand their meaning and scope only by comparing all the esoteric doctrines of the East. Pythagoras called his disciples to become mathematicians, for his higher teaching began with the doctrine of numbers. But this sacred mathematics or science of principles was both more transcendent and more alive than the profane mathematics, the only one known to our sages and philosophers. The number was not merely considered as an abstract quantity, but as the intrinsic and active virtue of the Supreme One, of God, the source of universal harmony. The science of numbers was that of the living forces of the divine faculties in action, in the worlds and in man, the macrocosm and the microcosm, penetrating them, distinguishing them, and explaining their interplay. Pythagoras was forming nothing less than a rational theory or theology. A true theology must provide the principles of all sciences. It will only be the science of God if it shows the unity and connection of the sciences of nature, deserving this name only if it constitutes the organ and synthesis of all the others. This was precisely the role that the science of the sacred word played in the Egyptian temples, formulated and specified by Pythagoras under the name of the science of numbers. It claimed to provide the key to being science and life. The adept, guided by the master, was to begin by contemplating the principles of his own intelligence before following its multiple applications in the concentric immensity of the spheres of evolution. A modern poet has sensed this truth by having Faust descend among the mothers to revive the ghost of Helen. Faust takes the magic key, the earth evaporates beneath his feet, dizziness seizes him, and he immerses himself in the void of the spaces. Finally, he arrives where the mothers watch over the original forms of the whole and bring forth beings from the mold of archetypes. These mothers are the numbers of Pythagoras, the divine forces of the world. The poet gives us the thrill of his own thought before this immersion in the depths of the unfathomable. For the ancient initiate, in whom the direct vision of intelligence was awakening little by little like a new sense, this inner revelation seemed rather like an ascent into the incandescent sun of truth, from where he contemplated, in the fullness of light, the beings and forms projected into the whirlpool of lives by a dizzying irradiation. This internal possession of truth, where man realizes universal life through the concentration of his faculties, does not happen in a day. Years of practice are necessary. The difficult agreement between intelligence and will must precede mastery of the creative word, and how few achieve this. It is necessary to decipher letter by letter and syllable by syllable the sacred word. Pythagoras was accustomed to imparting this teaching in the Temple of the Muses. The magistrates of Croton had built it at his request and under his direction near his home in a walled garden. The disciples of the second degree would enter there alone with the master. Inside this circular temple one could see the nine muses of marble standing at the centre, a veiled beast under a solemn and mysterious veil was watching. With her left hand she protected the flame of her hearth, and with her right hand she pointed to the sky. Among the Greeks and Romans she was called Hestia, 
or Vesta, the guardian of the latent divine principle in all things, the consciousness of the sacred fire. She has her altar in the temple of Delphi, in the Praetain of Athens, and in the humblest hearth. In the sanctuary of Pythagoras, she symbolized divine and central science, or theogony. Around her, the esoteric muses carried, in addition to their traditional and mythological names, the names of the occult sciences and sacred arts they guarded, invisible essence and divisible substance, active masculine principle, animator and passive feminine principle, or animated plastic matter. The dyad represented the union of the eternal masculine and the eternal feminine in God, the two essential and corresponding divine faculties. Orpheus poetically expressed this idea in this verse, Jupiter is the divine husband and wife. All polytheisms have intuitively been aware of this idea, representing divinity sometimes in masculine form, sometimes in feminine form, and this living and eternal nature, this great wife of God, is not only the earthly nature, but the celestial nature, invisible to our bodily eyes, the soul of the world, the primordial light, sometimes Maya, sometimes Isis or Sibylle, which vibrates first under the divine impulse, contains the essences of all souls, the spiritual types of all beings. It is then that the living earth and all the lands with the bodies they contain are the places where these souls come to incarnate. Next comes the woman, companion of man in humanity. The woman represents nature, and the perfect image of God is not man alone, but man and woman. Hence her invincible, charming and fatal attraction, hence the intoxication of love in which the dream of infinite creations plays out, and the dark premonition that the eternal masculine and the eternal feminine enjoy perfect union in the bosom of God. Honour therefore to the woman on earth and in heaven, said Pythagoras with all the ancient initiates, she makes us understand this great woman, nature, whether she is her sanctified image, and may she help us to ascend by degrees to the great soul of the world that procreates, preserves and renews, to the divine Sibylle, who carries the multitude of souls in her cloak of light. The monad represents the essence of God, the dyad its generative and reproductive faculty. This generates the world, the visible blossoming of God in space and time. But the real world is triple, for just as man is composed of three distinct but fused elements, body, soul, and spirit, the universe is divided into three concentric spheres, the natural world, the human world, and the divine world. The triad or law of the ternary is thus the constitutive law of things and the true key to life, as it is found at all levels of the life scale, from the physiological constitution of the animal body, the functioning of the blood and cerebrospinal systems, to the hyperphysical constitution of man, the universe, and God. Thus, it opens, as if by enchantment, to the amazed spirit, the internal structure of the universe. It shows the infinite correspondences of the macrocosm and microcosm. It acts like a light that penetrates things to make them transparent, causing both small and large worlds to shine like so many magical lanterns. Let us explain this law through the essential correspondence of man and the universe. Pythagoras admitted that the spirit of man or intellect has from God its immortal, invisible, and absolutely active nature, for the spirit is what moves by itself. He considered the body, on the other hand, as mortal, divisible, and passive. He believed that what we call the soul is closely linked to the spirit, but is formed by a third intermediate element that comes from the cosmic fluid. The soul thus resembles an ethereal body that the spirit weaves and constructs itself. Without this ethereal body, the material body could not be animated and would be nothing but an inert and lifeless mass. This is in accordance with a doctrine identical to that of the initiated St. Paul, who speaks of the spiritual body. The soul has a form similar to that of the body it vivifies and which survives it after dissolution or death. It then becomes, according to the expression of Pythagoras repeated by Plato, the subtle vehicle that leads the spirit toward the divine spheres or lets it fall into the shadowy regions of matter, depending on whether it is more or less good or bad. However, the constitution and evolution of man are repeated in circles that expand throughout the entire scale of beings and in all spheres, just as the human psyche struggles between the spirit that uplifts it and the body that holds it back. Thus humanity evolves between the natural and animal world, where it sinks its earthly roots, and the divine world of pure spirits, 
where its celestial source lies and toward which it aspires to ascend. What occurs in humanity occurs in all lands and in all solar systems, in always diverse proportions and in always new ways, extending the circle to infinity. And if you can encompass it in a single concept, the limitless worlds you will find in them, the creative thought, the astral fluid, and the evolving worlds, the spirit, the soul, and the body of the divinity lifting veil after veil and probing the faculties of the divinity itself, you will see the triad and the dyad, enveloped in the profound depth of the monad, like an efflorescence of stars in the depths of immensity. From this brief exposition, one can grasp the capital importance that Pythagoras placed on the law of the ternary. It can be said that it forms the cornerstone of esoteric science. All the great religious initiators have been aware of it. All the theosophers have presented it. An oracle of Zoroaster states that the number three reigns in the universe and that the monad is its principle. The incomparable merit of Pythagoras lies in having formulated it with the clarity of Greek genius, making it the center of his theory and the foundation of the sciences. The law of Plato's exoteric writings was veiled, but completely misunderstood by later philosophers. This conception penetrated modern times only among a few rare initiates of occult sciences. Among them, first and foremost, the golden verses of Pythagoras must be honored. This living conception of the forces of the universe penetrates from above to below. Nothing relates to the empty speculations of pure metaphysicians, such as the thesis, antithesis, and synthesis of Hegel. We can now see what a broad and solid basis the universal ternary offered for the classification of sciences, for the edifice of cosmogony and psychology. Just as the universal ternary concentrates in the unity of God or the monad, so too does the human ternary concentrate in self-consciousness and in the will that gathers all the faculties of the body, soul and spirit into its living unity. The human and divine ternary summarized in the monad constitutes the tetrad. But man alone realizes his unity in a relative manner, for his will, which acts on his entire being, cannot simultaneously and fully act in all three of his organs, that is, in instinct, soul and intellect. The universe and God himself present themselves to him only in turns and successively, reflected through these three mirrors, one seen through instinct and the kaleidoscope of the senses. God is multiple and infinite like his manifestations, hence the polytheism where the number of gods is limitless. Seen through the rational soul, God is noble, is dual, meaning spirit and matter, hence the dualism of Zoroaster, the Manichaeans, and several other religions. Seen through pure intellect, he is triple, meaning spirit, soul, and body in all manifestations. Hence the Trinitarian cults of India, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, for example, and the Trinity itself of Christianity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, conceived by the will that summarizes everything. God is unique, and we have the hermetic monotheism of Moses in all its rigor. Here there is no longer any personification or incarnation. We exit the visible universe and enter the absolute. The eternal reigns alone over the world, reduced to dust. The diversity of religions, therefore, arises from the fact that man realizes divinity only through his own being, which is relative and infinite, while God realizes at every moment the unity of the three worlds in the harmony of the universe. This last application would alone demonstrate the somewhat magical unity of the tetragram. In the order of ideas, one would find not only the law of beings and their mode of evolution at the principle of the sciences, but also the reason for diverse religions and their higher unity. This is truly the universal key, from which comes the enthusiasm with which Elisha speaks of it in the Golden Verses. We now understand why the Pythagoreans swore by this great symbol, I swear by him who has engraved the sacred tetrad in our hearts, immense and pure symbol, source of nature, model of the gods. Pythagoras went much further in the teaching of numbers. In each of them he defined a principle, a law, an active force. But he said that the essential principles are contained in the first four numbers, for by adding or multiplying them all the others are found. In the same way, the infinite variety of beings that make up the universe is produced by the combinations of the three primordial forces, matter, soul, spirit, under the creative impulse of the divine unity that mixes, differentiates, concentrates, and animates. With the main masters of esoteric science, Pythagoras placed great importance on the number seven and the number ten, 
The number seven, being the combination of three and four, signifies the union of man with divinity. It is the number of adepts and great initiates, and as it explains the complete realization of all things through seven degrees, it represents the law of evolution. The number ten, formed by the addition of the first four, and which contains the president, is the perfect number par excellence, as it represents all the evolved and united principles of divinity in a new unity. At the end of his teaching of Theogony, Pythagoras showed his disciples the nine muses personifying the sciences, grouped in threes, presiding over the evolved triple ternary in nine worlds, and forming with it the divine science, guardian of the primordial fire, the sacred decade, the third degree of perfection in Greek, telehotes, cosmogony and psychology, the evolution of the soul. The disciple had received from the master the principles of science. This first initiation had lifted the thick veils of matter that covered the eyes of his torn spirit, the brilliant veil of mythology. It had torn him from the visible world to eagerly immerse him in the limitless spaces and plunge him into the sun of intelligence from which the truth radiates across the three worlds. But the science of numbers was only the prelude to the great initiation. Armed with these principles, it was now a matter of descending from the souls of the Absolute to the depths of divine thought in the formation of things and in the evolution of the soul through the worlds. The esoteric cosmogony and psychology touched upon the greatest mysteries of life, dangerous secrets that were jealously guarded by the sciences and the occult arts. For this reason, Pythagoras liked to give these lessons away from the profane day, at night, by the sea, on the terraces of the Temple of Beings, at the gentle murmur of the Ionian waves, of such a melodious cadence, under the distant phosphorescence of the starry cosmos, or in the crypts of the sanctuary, where Egyptian naphtha lamps diffused a soft and even light. Initiated women attended these nocturnal gatherings, and sometimes priests or priestesses from Delphi or Eleusis came to confirm the teachings of the Master through the recounting of their experiences, or through the lucid words of clairvoyant dreams. The material evolution and the spiritual evolution of the world are two inverse but parallel and concordant movements throughout the scale of being. One is explained by the other, and seen together, they explain the world. Material evolution represents the manifestation of God in matter through the soul of the world that works it. Spiritual evolution represents the elaboration of consciousness in individual monads, their union through the cycle of lives with the divine spirit from which they emanate. Viewing the universe from a physical or spiritual perspective is not to consider a different object. It is to contemplate the world from opposite extremes. From the earthly point of view, the rational explanation of the world must begin with material evolution, as this is where we see it, but it shows us the work of the universal spirit in matter and continues the development of individual monads. This subtly leads us to the spiritual point of view and makes us move from the outside to the inside of things, from the reverse of the world to an almost deep background. Thus, Pythagoras viewed the universe as a living being animated by a great soul and penetrated by a great intelligence. The second part of his teaching therefore began with cosmogony. If we only focus on the exotic fragments of the Pythagoreans, their astronomy would resemble that of Ptolemy. The earth is immobile, and the sun revolves around it along with the planets and the entire sky. But the very principle of this astronomy warns us that it is purely symbolic. At the center of the universe, Pythagoras places fire, of which the sun is only a reflection. In Eastern symbolism, fire is the sign representing spirit, the universal divine consciousness. What our philosophers generally take for the physics of Pythagoras and Plato is therefore nothing more than a colorful description of his secret philosophy, luminous for the initiated, but all the more impenetrable for the vulgar, since they presented it as simple physics. Let us therefore seek in it a sort of cosmogony of the life of souls, and nothing more. The sublunar region refers to the spheres, the sphere where earthly attraction operates and is called the circle of generations. The initiates understood by this that the earth is for us the region of corporeal life. All operations that accompany the incarnation and disincarnation of souls take place there. The sphere of the six planets and the sun corresponds to the ascending categories of spirits. Olympus, conceived as a rotating sphere, is called the sky of the fixed stars, as it is likened to the sphere of perfect souls. 
This childlike astronomy thus covers a conception of the spiritual universe. But all this leads us to believe that the ancient initiates, and particularly Pythagoras, had much clearer notions of the physical universe. Aristotle positively states that the Pythagoreans believed in the movement of the earth around the sun. Copernicus asserts that the idea of the earth rotating around its axis came to him while reading Cicero, where a certain Aristotle of Syracuse spoke of the diurnal motion of the earth to his third-degree disciples. Pythagoras taught the double motion of the earth without having the exact measurements of modern science. He knew, like the priests of Memphis, that the planets, having emerged from the sun, revolve around it, that the stars are other solar systems governed by the same laws as ours, and that each has its rank in the immense universe. He also knew that each solar world forms a small universe that has its correspondence in the spiritual world and its own sky. The planets serve to mark the scale, but these notions, which would have evolved in popular mythology and which the multitude would have deemed sacrilegious, were never entrusted to vulgar writing. They were taught only under the seal of the deepest secret, certain strange definitions in the form of metaphors that have been transmitted to us and which originate from the Master's secret teaching hint at the grandiose conception Pythagoras had of the cosmos. In speaking of the constellations, he referred to the great and little bears as the hands of Rhea. Sibylle, or Sibylle, esoterically signifies the surrounding astral light, the divine wife of the universal fire, or the creative spirit that, concentrating in the solar systems, attracts the essences and materials of beings, seizes them, and draws them into the whirlwind of lives. He also referred to the planets as the dogs of Proserpine. This singular expression only makes sense on the esoteric level. Proserpine, the goddess of souls, presided over their incarnation in matter. Pythagoras thus called the planets the dogs of Proserpina because they guard and hold back the incarnated souls, just as the mythological Cerberus guards the souls in hell. The visible universe, Pythagoras said, the sky with all its stars, is but a transient form of the soul of the world, of the great Maya that concentrates scattered matter in infinite spaces, then dissolves it and disseminates it in an imperceptible cosmic fluid incarnating in denser matter. Humanity has lost its spiritual sense, but through its struggle and growing stronger with the external world, it has powerfully developed its reason, intelligence and will. The earth is the last step of this descent into matter that Moses calls the exit from paradise and Orpheus, the fall into the lunar southern circle. From there, man can laboriously ascend through a series of new existences and regain his spiritual senses through the free exercise of his intellect and will. Only then, say the disciples of Hermes and Orpheus, does man acquire, through his actions, the consciousness and power of the divine. Only then does he become a son of God, and those on earth who bear this name must have descended and ascended the dizzying spiral before appearing among us, which, through the humble psyche at its origin, is a breath passing, a germ floating, a bird beaten by the winds, migrating from life to life and yet, after shipwreck, through millions of years, has become a daughter of God and recognizes no other homeland than heaven. This is why Greek poetry, with its deep and luminous symbolism, has compared the soul to the winged insect, sometimes a worm, sometimes a celestial butterfly. How many times has it been a chrysalis, and how many times a butterfly it will never know, but it feels that it has wings. Such is the dizzying past of the human soul. It explains its present condition and allows us to glimpse its future. What is the situation of the divine psyche in earthly life? Regardless of the reflection, one could not imagine something stranger and more tragic. Since it has painfully penetrated the thick air of the earth, the soul is bound to the folds of the body. It lives, breathes, and thinks only through it, and yet it is not it. As the soul develops, it feels a trembling light growing within it, something invisible and material that it calls its spirit, its consciousness. Yes, man has an innate feeling of his triple nature, as he instinctively distinguishes his body from his soul and his soul from his spirit. The captive and tormented soul struggles between its two companions, as if caught between the pressure of a serpent with a thousand folds and an invisible genius that calls to it, but whose presence is felt only by its touch and fleeting sparks. Sometimes this body absorbs it to such an extent that it lives only through its sensations and passions. With it, 
It becomes angry or burns in the thick cloud of carnal pleasures until it is frightened by the profound silence of its invisible companion. Other times drawn by it, it loses itself in such heights of thought that it forgets the existence of its body until the latter reminds it of its presence with a tyrannical call to order. And in the meantime, an inner voice tells it that between it and the invisible host, the bond is indissoluble. Although death breaks its ties with the body, the soul, tossed from side to side in its eternal struggle, seeks in vain for happiness and truth. Vainly, it seeks itself in its fleeting sensations, in its escaping thoughts, in a world that changes like a mirage, finding nothing that lasts, tormented, tossed like a leaf in the wind. It doubts itself and its divine world, which reveals itself to it only through its pain and its inability to reach it. Human ignorance is written in the contradictions of supposed sages, and human sorrow in the unfathomable thirst of the human gaze. Ultimately, no matter the extent of their knowledge, birth and death confine man between two fatal limits. They are two doors of darkness beyond which nothing is seen. The flame of his life ignites upon entering through the moon and extinguishes upon exiting through the other. The same will be true for the soul, except that it is the answer philosophers have given to this distressing problem. It has been very diverse. The answer of the theosophists of all times is the same concerning the essential. It aligns with universal feeling and the intimate spirit of religions. They have expressed the truth only in the form of superstitions and symbols. Esoteric doctrine opens much broader perspectives, and its assertions align with the laws of universal evolution. Here is what initiates, instructed by tradition and by many experiences of psychic life, have told man. What stirs within you? What you call your soul is an ethereal double of the body that contains within itself an immortal spirit. The spirit is constructed and woven through its own activity, its spiritual body. Pythagoras calls it the subtle chariot of the soul, as it is destined to pull it from the earth after death. This spiritual body is the organ of the spirit, its sensitive envelope, its voluntary instrument, and it serves to animate the body, which would be inert without it. In the apparitions of the dying or the dead, this double reveals itself, but this always presupposes a special nervous state in the seer. The utility, power, and perfection of the spiritual body vary according to the quality of the spirit it contains, and there are more numerous nuances and greater differences between the substance of souls, woven in astral light, but impregnated with the imponderable fluids of the earth, than among all earthly bodies and all states of ponderable matter. This astral body, although much more subtle and perfect than the earthly one, is not mortal like the monad it contains. It changes, purifies itself according to the environments it traverses. The spirit molds it, perpetually transforming it in its image, but does not abandon it and keeps itself from it, gradually donning more ethereal substances. Here is what Pythagoras taught. He did not conceive of the abstract spiritual entity, the monad, the spirit manifests acting in the depths of the heavens as on earth. It must have an organ. This organ is the living soul, bestial or sublime, dark or radiant, but having the human form, this image of God. What happens at death? As the agony approaches, the soul generally senses its impending separation from the body. It relives its entire earthly existence in brief tableau, in rapid succession and astonishing clarity. But when life, exhausted, stops in the brain, it becomes troubled and loses total consciousness. If it is a holy and pure soul, its spiritual senses have already awakened through its gradual disintegration from matter. Before dying, it had, in some way, whether only through introspection of its own state, the feeling of the presence of the other, to the silent entreaties, to the distant calls, to the vague rays of the invisible. The earth has already lost its consciousness, and when the soul finally escapes from the cold corpse, happy for its liberation, it feels itself carried into a light towards the spiritual family to which it belongs. But this does not happen with the ordinary man whose life has been shared between material instincts and higher aspirations. He awakens with a semi-consciousness, as in the heavy feeling of a nightmare, ready to scream, but he remembers, suffers, exists in a limbo of darkness and fear. The only thing he sees is his corpse from which he is detached, but towards which he still feels an invincible attraction, for it is through this that he lived. 
And now what does he do? He horrifies himself seeking in the icy fibers of his brain, in the coagulated blood of his veins, and does not find himself. There he is dead. He is alive. He wants to leave, but darkness encloses him. Within him all is chaos. He sees only one thing, and this draws and horrifies him. The sinister phosphorescence of his remains. And the nightmare begins. This state can prolong for months, even years. Its duration depends on the strength of the material instincts of the soul. But whether good or bad, hellish or celestial, the soul gradually acquires the consciousness of itself and its new state. Once free from its body, it escapes into the depths of the earthly atmosphere, where electric rivers carry it from side to side, and where it begins to see multiform wanderers more or less similar to itself, like fleeting sparks in a thick mist. Then begins a dizzying and fierce struggle of the soul, half asleep to rise towards the upper veils of the air, to free itself from earthly attraction and to gain in the sky of our planetary system the region that is its own and which only its friendly guides can show it. But before they can hear and see them, it is often necessary for the soul to wait a long time. This phase of the soul's life has carried various names in religions and mythologies. Moses calls it Orev, Orpheus calls it Erebus, Christianity refers to it as purgatory or the valley of the shadow of death. The Greek initiates identified it with the cone of shadow that the earth always drags behind it, reaching as far as the moon, which is why they called it the abyss of Hecate. In this dark well, souls turned and swirled. According to the Orphics and Pythagoreans, souls sought to reach the circle of the moon through desperate efforts, while the violence of the winds cast thousands back to the earth. Homer and Virgil compared it to whirlwinds of leaves and swarms of birds frightened by the storm. The moon played a significant role in ancient esotericism. It was said that, on its side turned toward the sky, souls went to purify their astral bodies before continuing their celestial ascent. It was also believed that heroes and spirits lingered for some time on its side, turned toward the earth to don a body suitable for our world before coming to reincarnate. The moon was somehow attributed with the power to magnetize the soul for earthly incarnation and to demagnetize it for the heavens. In general, these expressions, which initiates imbued with both real and symbolic meanings, indicated that the soul must undergo an intermediate state of purification and rid itself of the impurities of the earth before continuing its journey. But how do they portray the arrival of a pure soul in a world that belongs to it? The earth disappears like a nightmare, a new dream. A delightful fainting envelops it like a caress. It sees only its guide by its side, who swiftly carries it like lightning through the depths of space. What can be said of its awakening in the valleys of an ethereal star, devoid of elemental atmosphere, where everything, mountains, flowers, vegetation, is formed by exquisite, sensitive and speaking nature? What can be said especially of those luminous forms, men and women, who surround it in a sacred body to initiate it into the holy mystery of its new life. They are gods, no, they are not souls like hers, and the wonders that its intimate thoughts evoke on their faces, tenderness, love, desire or fear, radiate through these diaphanous bodies in their range of luminous colorations. Here, bodies and faces are no longer the masks of the soul, rather, the transparent soul appears in its true form and shines in the full light of its pure truth. Thus, it has regained its divine homeland, for the secret light in which it bathes emanates from itself and returns to it in the smiles of beloved beings. This light of happiness is the soul of the world, and in it, it feels the presence of God. Now there are no more obstacles. It will love, no, live with no other limit than its own capacity, its own flight. Oh, what a strange and wonderful thing! It feels united with all its companions by profound affinities, for in the life beyond, those who do not love repel each other, and only those who understand each other come together, and together they celebrate the divine mysteries in more beautiful temples, in more perfect communion. They will be living poems, always new, each soul being a stanza, where each one will relive its life in those of the others. Then trembling, it will launch itself toward the light above, at the call of the envoys of the salt spirits of those who call themselves gods because they have escaped the cycle of generations. Guided by these sublime intelligences, 
it will attempt to decipher the great verb of the great poem of the hidden verb, to understand what it can distinguish from the symphony of the universe. It will receive the hierarchical teachings of the circles of divine love, will try to see the essences that spread through the worlds of animating spirits, will contemplate the glorified spirits, living rays of the God of gods, and will be unable to bear their brilliance, which dims the suns like flickering lamps. And when it returns frightened by these dazzling journeys, because it feels chills before these vastnesses, it will hear from afar the voices of beloved beings and will fall back upon the golden shores of its star under the rosy veil of an undulating dream, filled with white forms, perfumes and melodies. Such is the celestial life of the soul, which our spirit, tainted by the impurities of the earth, can hardly conceive, but which the initiates and seers intuit, demonstrating the law of analogies and correspondences. Our coarse images, our imperfect language, strive in vain to translate this life, but every living soul feels its seed in its hidden depths. If it is impossible for us to demonstrate it in the present state, the hidden philosophy formulates its psychic conditions, the idea of the invisible ethereal stars for us, yet part of our solar system and serving as a dwelling for happy souls, is frequently found in the arcana of esoteric tradition. Pythagoras calls this the dobliterio of the earth, the tone illuminated by the central fire, that is to say, by divine light. At the end of the Phaedo, Plato abundantly describes, albeit in a disguised manner, this spiritual earth. He states that it is as light as air and surrounded by an ethereal atmosphere. In the other life, the soul therefore retains all its individuality from its earthly existence. It keeps only noble memories, and lets the others fall into that oblivion which poets have called the waves of Lethe. Guided by its stains, the human soul feels its consciousness as inverted. From the external part of the universe, it has entered into its intimate part. Sibylle Maya, the soul of the world, has gathered it in her bosom with her deep aspiration. There the psyche will complete its drowsiness. It is a broken dream, resumed at all hours and without end. On earth, it will finish it according to the measure of its earthly effort and the light acquired, but it will expand it a hundredfold. The pulverized hopes will bloom in the dawn of its divine life. The dark sunsets of the earth will illuminate into bright days. Yes, man, even if he has lived only one hour of enthusiasm or selflessness, that one pure note torn from the dissonant scale of his earthly life will resonate in his beyond in wondrous progressions, in wind harmonies. The fleeting joys that the charms of music, the ecstasies of love, or the transports of charity bring us, are merely the decayed notes of a symphony that we will then hear. In other words, this life will be nothing but a long dream, a grand hallucination. But what could be more real than what the soul feels within itself, than what it realizes in its divine communion with other souls? The initiates, who are the consistent and transcendent idealists, have always believed that the only real and lasting things on earth are the manifestations of spiritual beauty, love, and truth. As the beyond can have no other object than this truth, this beauty, and this love for those who have made them the objects of their lives, they are convinced that heaven will be truer than earth. The celestial life of the soul can last hundreds or thousands of years, depending on its rank and impulse strength, but it can only prolong this indefinitely, for the most perfect, the most sublime, those who have crossed the boundaries. These souls have not only attained temporary rest, but the immortal action of truth. They have created their wings, which are inviolable because they are light, and they govern the worlds because through them they see. As for the others, they are led by an inflexible law to reincarnate, in order to undergo a new trial and rise to a higher level, or fall lower and fade away. Like earthly life, spiritual life has its principle, its peak and its decline. When this life is exhausted, the soul feels overwhelmed by heaviness, vertigo and melancholy, an invincible force draws it back toward the struggles and sufferings of the earth. This desire is mingled with terrible apprehensions and immense pain at leaving divine life. But the time has come. The law must be fulfilled. The weight increases, and darkness falls upon the soul. It no longer sees its luminous companions except through a veil, and this veil, growing thicker, makes it sense the imminent separation. It hears their sad farewells, the souls of beloved benefactors penetrate it like celestial dew, 
leaving in its heart an ardent thirst for unknown happiness. Then, through solemn oaths, it promises to remember. To remember the light in the world of darkness, the truth in the world of lies, the love in the world of hatred. The return, the immortal crown, is attained at this price. It awakens in its thick atmosphere, ethereal star, diaphanous souls, oceans of light, all has disappeared. It is already on earth, in the abyss of rebirth, and yet it has not yet lost the celestial memory. And the guide at its side, now visible to its eyes, points to the woman who will be its mother. She carries within her the germ of a child, but this germ will only live if the spirit animates it. Then, for nine months, the most unforgivable mystery of earthly life takes place, that of incarnation and motherhood. The mysterious fusion occurs slowly, wisely, organ by organ, fiber by fiber, as the soul immerses itself in this warm den. The consciousness of its divine life fades and extinguishes, for between it and the light above rise the waves of blood, the tissues of flesh that suffocate it and fill it with darkness. Already, that distant light, only in its dying glow, finally a horrible pain compresses it, grips it like in a tourniquet, a bloody convulsion tearing it from the maternal soul nails it in its throbbing body. The child is born, miserable, and cries out in terror, but the celestial memory has entered the hidden depths of its unconscious. This memory will only revive through knowledge or through pain, through love or through death. The law of incarnation and disincarnation thus reveals to us the true meaning of life and death. It constitutes the capital knot in the evolution of the soul, and allows us to follow it backward and forward to the depths of nature and divinity, for this law reveals to us the rhythm and measure, the reason and the object of its immortality. From abstract or fantastic, it makes it alive and logical, showing the correspondences of life and death. Earthly birth is a death from the spiritual point of view, and death is a celestial resurrection. The alternative of the two lives is necessary for the development of the soul, and each of the two is both the consequence and the explanation of the other. He who has penetrated these truths finds himself at the heart of the mysteries, at the center of initiation. But what does the continuity of the soul, the monad, the spiritual entity, through all these existences prove, since it successively loses its memory? And what does it prove to you? It responds to the identity of our person during the waking state and during sleep. You wake up each morning in a state as strange, as inexplicable as if you were resurrecting from nothingness and returning to plunge into it at night. Wasn't it nothingness? No, for you dreamed and your dreams were for you as real as reality. A change in the physiological conditions of the brain has altered the relationships between the soul and the body and shifted your psychic viewpoint. You were the same individual, but you found yourself in another environment and lived another existence. In the hypnotized, the somnambulists and the clairvoyants, dreams develop new faculties that seem miraculous to us, but which are the natural faculties of the soul separated from the body. Once awake, these clairvoyants no longer remember what they have seen, said or done during their lucid sleep, but they remember perfectly in one of their dreams what happened in the previous dream and predict what will happen in the next. They thus have two consciousnesses, two entirely distinct lives, but each of them has its rational continuity and winds around a single individuality, like cords of different colors around an invisible thread. It had a very deep meaning, that the ancient initiated poets called sleep the brother of death, for a veil of forgetfulness separates sleep from wakefulness, as is the case with birth and death. Just as our earthly life divides into two always alternating parts, so the eternal soul in its cosmic evolutionary immensity finds itself between incarnation and spiritual life, between earth and heaven. This alternating passage from one plane of the universe to another this inversion of the poles of being is no less necessary for the development of the soul than the alternation of wakefulness and sleep is for the bodily life of man. We need the waves of the ether in passing from one existence to another. In this one a salutary veil hides the past and the future from us, but forgetfulness is not total and a light filters through the veil. Innate ideas prove for themselves a prior existence, but there is more. We are born as if with a world of vague reminiscences, mysterious impulses, divine presentiments. There are in children born of gentle and calm parents eruptions of wild passions that atavism alone cannot explain. 
and which come from a previous existence. There are sometimes in the humblest lives inexplicable and sublime loyalties to a feeling, to an idea that do not come from the promises and oaths of celestial life, for the hidden memory that the soul has kept of itself is stronger than all earthly reasons. Depending on whether the soul inclines toward this memory or abandons it, it must be or succumb. True faith is this silent fidelity of the soul to itself. For this reason, it is understandable that Pythagoras, like all theosophists, viewed corporeal life as a necessary elaboration of the will and celestial life as spiritual growth and fulfillment. Lives follow one another and are not alike, but they are chained together by an unrelenting logic. If each has its own law and special destiny, their link is governed by a singular law that one might call the repercussion of lives. According to this, the law called karma by the Brahmins and Buddhists, under this law, the actions of one life have a fatal repercussion in the next life. Not only will man be reborn with the instincts and faculties he has developed in his previous life, but the very nature of his existence will be largely determined by the good or bad use he has made of his freedom in the previous life. There is no word or action that does not leave its echo in eternity, says a proverb. According to the esoteric doctrine, this proverb applies from the letter of one life to another. For Pythagoras, the apparent injustices of fate, distortions, miseries, strokes of fortune, misfortunes of every kind find their explanation in the fact that each existence is the reward or punishment of the previous one. A criminal life engenders a life of atonement, an imperfect life, another of tests, a good life determines a mission, a superior life a creative mission. The moral sanction that applies with apparent imperfection from the viewpoint of a single life thus applies with admirable imperfection and meticulous justice in the series of lives. In this series, there may be progression toward spirituality and toward intelligence, just as there may be regression toward bestiality and matter. As the soul rises, it acquires a greater share in its choice of reincarnations. The lower soul endures its dominion, the middle soul chooses from those offered to it, while the higher soul, imposed with a mission, chooses it by negation. The higher the soul, the more it retains consciousness, and the clearer its irresistible perception of the spiritual life that reigns beyond our earthly horizon, enveloping it like an atmosphere of light, sending its rays into our darkness. Tradition also says that first-line initiators, the divine prophets of humanity, remembered their previous earthly lives. According to legend, Gautama Buddha, Sakyamuni, found in his ecstasy the thread of his past existences, and it is said of Pythagoras that, thanks to a special favor from the gods, he manifested the memory of certain of his past lives. We have said that in the series of lives, the soul can retrogress or progress depending on whether it succumbs to its lower or divine nature. This leads to an important consequence, the truth of which has always been felt by human consciousness with a strange shiver. In all lives, there are struggles to endure, choices to make, decisions to take, the consequences of which are incalculable. However, the upward path of good that runs through a considerable series of incarnations must eventually lead to a life, one day, perhaps an hour, where the soul, having reached full consciousness of good and evil, can elevate itself through a final and sovereign effort to a height from which it will no longer need to descend, where the path to the summit begins. Similarly, on the downward path of evil, there exists a point where the perverse soul can still retrace its steps, but once that point is crossed, the hardening is definitive. From existence to non-existence, the soul will roll to the depths of darkness and lose its humanity. Man becomes demon, the demon becomes animal, and his indestructible monad will be forced to begin the exhausting and terrible evolution through the series of ascending kingdoms and countless existences. Here lies the true infinity. According to the law of evolution, which is not as terrible and more logical than that of esoteric religions, the soul can thus descend on the path of the life of lives. As for earthly humanity, its evolution occurs according to the law of an upward progression that is part of the divine order. This truth, which we believe to have recently discovered, was known and taught in the ancient mysteries. Animals are relatives of man, and man is a relative of the gods, said Pythagoras. He philosophically developed what the mysteries of Eleusis also taught, the progress of ascending kingdoms, 
the aspiration of the plant world to the animal world, from the animal world to the human world, and the succession within humanity of increasingly perfect races. This progress does not occur uniformly, but through regular and increasing cycles, some enclosed within others. Each people has its youth, its maturity, and its decadence. The same applies to races as a whole, with the red race, the black race, and the white race having successively reigned over the globe. The white race, even at its peak, has not yet reached maturity. In our days, at its apex, it will develop within itself a race perfected by the restoration of initiation and by the spiritual choice of marriages. In this way, races follow each other. Thus, humanity progresses. Ancient initiates went much further than modern ones in their foresight. They accepted that there would come a time when the great mass of individuals who make up current humanity would pass to another planet to begin a new cycle in the series of cycles that constitute the planetary chain. All humanity will develop the intellectual, spiritual and transcendent principles that the great initiates have cultivated within themselves since this life and will generalize them in a broader fluorescence. It is not only a matter of saying that this development encompasses not just thousands but millions of years and that it will bring about such changes in the human condition that we cannot imagine them. To characterize them, Plato says that at that time the gods will truly inhabit the temples of men. It is logical to admit that within the planetary chain, that is, in the successive evolutions of our humanity on other planets, their incarnations will become increasingly ethereal, gradually bringing them closer to the purely spiritual state of that octave sphere which lies beyond the circle of generations and whose name is given by ancient theosophers to designate the divine state. It is also natural that, since not all have the same impetus, many remain on the way or fall again, the number of the elect continually diminishes. In this prodigious ascent, there is enough to produce vertigo in our earthbound limited intelligences, but the celestial intelligences contemplate it without fear, just as we contemplate a single life. The evolution of souls thus understood is not contrary to the unity of spirit. It is the principle of principles, with the homogeneity of nature, this law of laws with the continuity of movement, this force of forces. Viewed through the prism of spiritual life, a solar system is not merely a material mechanism, but a living organism, a celestial kingdom where souls travel from world to world like the very breath of God. What then is the final objective of man and humanity according to esoteric doctrine? After so many lives, deaths, births, chains and awakenings, there is a term to the labors of the psyche, say the initiates. When the soul has definitively conquered matter, when, developing all its spiritual faculties, it has found within itself the principle and the end of all things. Then having no more need of incarnation, it will enter the divine state through its complete union with divine intelligence. And as we can barely sense the spiritual life of the soul after each earthly life, how could we imagine this perfect life that will follow the entire series of its spiritual existences? This heaven of heavens will be for it what the ocean is for its rivers. For Pythagoras, the apotheosis of man was not immersion in unconsciousness, but creative and supreme activity. The soul becomes pure spirit and does not lose its individuality. It perfects it by joining its archetype in God. It remembers all its previous existences, which seem to it like so many rungs to reach the degree from which it embraces and penetrates the universe. In this state, man is no longer man, as Pythagoras said. He is a demigod because he reflects in his being the ineffable law that God fills the immensity. For him to know is to be able, to love is to create, to be is to radiate. Truth and beauty are definitive. This term, spiritual eternity, has other measures than solar time, but it also has its stages, norms and cycles. Only these are far above human conceptions, but the law of progressive analogies in the ascending kingdoms of nature allows us to assert that once the spirit has reached this sublime state, it can no longer turn back, and that the visible worlds change and pass away, the invisible world, which is its reason for being its source and mouth, and of which the divine psyche is a part, is immortal, bearing bright perspectives. Pythagoras finished the story of the divine psyche. The last word had expired on the lips of the sage, but the sense of the incomprehensible truth remained suspended in the still air of the crypt. 
Everyone believed they had completed the dream of lives and awakened in great peace in the sweet ocean of unique and limitless existence. The oil lamps quietly illuminated the statue of Persephone, beginning as a celestial harvest goddess, and thus her symbolic story revived in the sacred frescoes of the sanctuary, sometimes a priestess, entering into ecstasy under the harmonious voice of Pythagoras, seemed to embody in her posture and radiant face the ineffable beauty of his vision, and the disciples, struck by a religious shiver, looked on in silence, but soon the master, with a slow and sure gesture, brought the earth back to the profane. Gradually, his features relaxed, and he weakened, falling into the arms of his companions in a deep lethargy from which she awoke confused, sad and exhausted from her subtle flight. Then they ascended from the crypt to the gardens of Ceres, in the coolness of dawn that was beginning to brighten over the sea at the edge of the starry sky. Fourth degree epiphany, the adept, the initiated woman, love and marriage. We have just reached with Pythagoras the pinnacle of ancient initiation. From this height, the earth appears stifled in shadow like a dying star. From here, ideal perspectives open up, and a wonderful array of views unfolds towards the heights, the epiphany of the universe. The epiphany or view from above, the autopsy or direct vision, the theophany or manifestation of God, are all correlating ideas and various expressions, designating the state of perfection in which the initiate, having united their soul with God, contemplates total truth. But the purpose of the teaching was not to absorb man into contemplation or ecstasy. The Master had guided his disciples through the immeasurable regions of the cosmos, immersing them in the abysses of the invisible. In this terrible journey of the true initiates, they were to return to earth better, stronger, and better prepared for the trials of life. The initiation of intelligence was to be followed by that of will, the most difficult of all, for it was now the disciples' task to bring down the truth from the depths of their being, to realize the work in the practice of life. To achieve this ideal, according to Pythagoras, it was necessary to gather three improvements, to realize the truth in intelligence, virtue in the soul, and purity in the body. Wise hygiene and measured continence were to maintain bodily strength. Any excess of the body leaves a mark and a stain in the astral body, the living organism of the soul. And therefore, because the astral body participates in all acts of the material body, it is the one that accomplishes them. For the body, without it, is merely an inert mass. It is thus necessary that the body be purified so that the soul may be as well. It is also necessary that the soul, constantly illuminated by intelligence, acquires value, negation, and faith, in a word, virtue, so that a second nature may form to replace the first. Lastly, it is essential that the intellect attain wisdom through knowledge, such that in everything it knows how to distinguish good from evil and see God in the smallest of beings as well as in the entirety of worlds. At this stage man is an adept, and if he possesses sufficient energy, he comes into possession of new faculties and powers. The inner senses of the soul open up. The will radiates to others. His bodily magnetism, permeated by the emanations of his astral soul, electrified by his will, acquires a seemingly miraculous power. Sometimes he heals the sick by the laying on of hands, or merely by his presence. Often he penetrates the thoughts of men merely by his gaze. At other times in a waking state he sees events occurring at a distance. We will cite two famous facts of this kind, absolutely authentic. The first took place in antiquity, and the hero is the famous philosopher Apollonius of Tiana. First fact. Second sight of Apollonius of Tiana. While these events, such as the assassination of Emperor Domitian, were happening in Rome, Apollonius saw them in Ephesus. Domitian was attacked by Clement around noon on the same date, at the same moment that Apollonius was lecturing, in the gardens leading to Chistus. Suddenly he lowered his voice as if struck by a sudden fear. He continued his discourse, but his language lacked its usual strength, as happens to those who are thinking of something else. Then he fell silent, like someone who has lost the thread of their discourse, casting terrible glances upward. God took three or four steps forward and exclaimed, Wound the tyrant! It seemed as if he were seeing not the image of the event in a mirror, but the event itself in all its reality. The people of Ephesus, for the entire population was attending Apollonius's lecture, remained silent in astonishment. Apollonius paused like a man searching for the conclusion of a doubtful event. 
Finally, he exclaimed, Take courage, Ephesians. The tyrant has been killed today. What do I say today? By Minerva, he has just been killed right now, as I was interrupted. The Ephesians believed Apollonius had gone mad. They ardently wished he had spoken the truth, but feared it might bring them danger. Soon after, messengers arrived to announce the good news and testify in favor of Apollonius's knowledge, for the tyrant's death had indeed occurred on that very day, at noon. The author who witnessed Apollonius stated that all these details perfectly matched those the gods had shown him on the day of his lecture to the Ephesians, the life of Apollonius of Tiana, translated by Chanson. Second fact, second sight of Swedenborg. The second fact is related to the greatest seer of all. One can debate the objective reality of Swedenborg's visions, but one cannot doubt his second sight, attested by a multitude of facts. Swedenborg's vision occurred 30 leagues away from the fire in Stockingham. This caused quite a stir in the second half of the 18th century. The famous German philosopher had research conducted by his friend in Sweden, in Gothenburg, the city where the event had taken place. And here is what he wrote to one of his friends. The following fact seems to me to possess the greatest demonstrative strength and to cut short any kind of controversy. It was in 1759 when, towards the end of September, on a Saturday at around 4 p.m., Emanuel Swedenborg, returning from England, stopped at Golden Hamburg at William Castle. He was invited there along with about 15 people. Around six o'clock, Swedenborg, who had gone out, returned to the parlour, pale and distraught, and said that at that moment a great fire had just broken out in Stockholm in his neighbourhood, and that the fire was spreading violently toward his house. He stated that the house of one of his friends, whom he named, had been reduced to ashes, and that his own was in danger. At 8 p.m. after another outing, he joyfully said, Thank God the fire has been extinguished at the third door before mine. That same night, he informed the governor. The following Sunday morning, Swedenborg was summoned by this official who questioned him about what he had said. Swedenborg described the fire accurately, its beginning, its end, and its duration. On the same day, news spread throughout the population, which became even more agitated when the governor took notice, and many people worried about their belongings and friends. On the following Monday afternoon, a courier arrived at Golden Hamburg, dispatched by the commerce of Stockholm during the fire. In these letters, the fire was described exactly as he had just said. What can be alleged against the authenticity of this event? The friend who wrote has verified all of this, not only in Stockholm, but also two months earlier in Gothenburg. He is very well acquainted with the most respectable houses there and was able to fully inquire into this population where most eyewitnesses still live, given the short time, nine years having passed since 1759. Letter to mail Charlotte de Novich, quoted by mother, Life of Swedenborg. The work from a distance, through the concentration of thought and will on persons who are akin to it from afar, as if its astral body could transport itself outside of its material body, the appearance of the dying or the dead to friends is exactly the same phenomenon, only that the appearance produced by the dying or the soul of the dead, generally through an unconscious desire in anguish or in the second death, is executed by the adept in full health and full consciousness. However, he can only do this during sleep and almost always during a lethargic sleep. Finally, the adept feels surrounded and protected by invisible, superior and luminous beings who lend him their strength and assist him in his mission. Few are the adepts, even fewer are those who attain this power. Through him he only knew three, Orpheus at the dawn of Hellenism, Pythagoras at his peak, and Apollonius of Tyana at his end. Orpheus was the great inspired and the great initiator of the region of Greece, Pythagoras the organizer of esoteric science and philosophy of the schools, Apollonius the moral stoic and popular mage of decadence. In these three, despite the degrees and nuances, shines the divine ray, the passionate spirit for the salvation of souls, the indomitable energy clothed in gentleness and serenity. But do not approach too closely to these great tranquil foreheads that blossom in silence. One feels beneath them the heat of an ardent will, but always contained. Pythagoras, therefore, does not represent a first-order adept, with a scientific mind and a philosophical formula that brings him closer to modern thought. Yet he could neither claim nor pretended to be one of his disciples, the adepts who had reached perfection. A great error always has, at its origin, a great inspirer. 
His disciples and those who followed him formed the chain and the group, spreading his thought throughout the world. At the fourth degree of initiation, Pythagoras was content to teach his followers the applications of his doctrine of life. The epiphany, or visions from above, offered a profound and regenerating perspective on the illusory and transient earthly things. The origin of good and evil is an incomprehensible mystery for those who have not become aware of the origin and the end. A morality that does not take into account the ultimate destinies of man will be merely utilitarian and very imperfect. Furthermore, human freedom does not truly exist for those who always feel enslaved by their passions, nor does there exist any right for those who do not believe in the soul or in God, for whom life is a flash between two voids, the former live in the servitude of the soul chained to passions, while the latter are in the servitude of intelligence limited to the physical world. This is not the case for the religious man or the true philosopher, and even less so for the initiated theosopher who realizes the truth in the trinity of his being and in the unity of his will. To understand the origin of good and evil, the initiate looks at the three worlds with the eyes of the spirit. He sees the dark world of matter and animality, where inexorable fate dominates. He sees the luminous world of spirit, which for us is the invisible world, the immense hierarchy of free souls where divine law reigns and which constitutes providence in action by itself. Between the two, he sees in chiaroscuro humanity, which plunges through its base into the natural world and touches through its peaks the divine world. His genius is freedom, for as soon as man perceives truth and error, he is free to choose to unite with providence by fulfilling the truth, or to fall under the law of fate by following error. The act of truth, united to the intellectual act by instinct, is nothing other than a mathematical point. But from this point springs the spiritual universe. Every spirit partially feels. What the theosopher comprehends totally by intellect namely that evil is what brings man down towards the fatality of matter, while good is what elevates him towards the divine law of his true destiny. This destiny is to ascend ever higher through his own effort, but for this it is also necessary that he be free to descend to the lowest depths. The circle of freedom expands to the infinitely great as one rises and shrinks to the infinitely small as one descends. The higher one ascends, the freer one becomes. The more one enters into the light, the more strength one acquires for good. The further one descends, the more one becomes enslaved, for each fall into evil diminishes the understanding of truth and the capacity for good. Fate reigns over the past, freedom over the future, and providence over both, that is, over the present. There always exists what one might call eternity. This idea logically emerges from the human and divine ternary of the trinity of the macrocosm that we have outlined in the previous chapters. The metaphysical correlation between fate, freedom, and providence has been admirably deduced by the venerable Olivets in his commentary on the golden verses of Pythagoras. From the combined action of fate, freedom, and providence arise the countless destinies, hells, and paradises of souls. Evil, as discord with divine law, is not the work of God but of man, and has only a relative, apparent, and transient existence. Good, as concord with divine law, exists only in a real and eternal manner. Neither the priests of Delphi or Lucis, nor the initiated philosophers ever wished to reveal these profound ideas to the people who might have misinterpreted and abused them. In the mysteries, this doctrine is symbolically presented by the displacement of Dionysus, but covering with an impenetrable veil the profane, what was called the sufferings of God. The greatest religious and philosophical discussions revolve around the question of the origin of good and evil. We have just seen that the esoteric doctrine holds the key to its mysteries. There is another crucial question, dependent on the social and political problem, that of the inequality of human conditions. The spectacle of evil and suffering has something terrible about it. One can add that its distribution, seemingly arbitrary, is unjust. This is the origin of all hatred, all rebellions, and all negations.